This is Jocko Podcast number 278 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. It's a little cold outside, but it doesn't matter. Nothing else matters right now except doing my job right. This job. I take another step as gently as I can, as quietly as I can. This is where it all matters. I can't let them hear me. If they do, they'll be gone. And I won't get my shot. I take another quiet step. I see my buddy freeze. He sees them. They must be in range. My buddy slowly looks back at me and gives me a nod. It's go time. I prepare my weapon. By now, I know this weapon well. I've shot thousands of rounds through it in the last year for this moment. Ever since I was a little kid, it's been this way. Stalking through the woods, closing the distance, trying to see without being seen. My adult life was much of the same, sneaking around in the woods or in the desert or in the city or in the jungle. I take a few more steps and find some cover by a tree. This will keep me hidden. My buddy gives me a hand signal. He's giving me the range. Nothing else matters. I initiate the procedures. My mind is full, but it's empty. My heart is beating, but it's steady. It all comes down to this moment. I'm alive. Now that may have sounded like a combat scenario, but it wasn't. It was a description of a more recent pursuit of mine. Bow hunting. And the buddy I reference is a real person. A real person who's a incredible archer, an amazing hunter, One of the best coaches I have ever worked with in any discipline. And most important, a friend that is always ready to help. Not just me, but an entire community of people. The world-renowned founder of Knock on Archery, John Dudley. Dud? What's up, man? Thanks for coming I on. I want you to finish that story. <laughs> <laughs> but that was oh. awesome. <laughs> it was like fire, right? Yeah, and especially this season where we were on a lot of bulls, and that happened. That little that little thing played out time and time and time, and time, and time again. again. And I ended up not getting any shots off, but man, it was freaking fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Let's go. I, there's a lot of people that really don't know much about you. And uh, let's let's go back to the beginning because <laughs> I have heard pieced together stories of your life, and there's a lot of good ones, man. <laughs> it's yeah. always surprising that you're here. You weren't arrested. You're not in prison. <laughs> you're not dead. You know, there's a lot of different Amen, avenues that. you could have headed down. <laughs> Dang right. Yeah, just a horrible. I don't deserve my wife or my son because, like, <laughs> all the time I'm just like, karma. Like, he's that real patient sniper. And at some point, like, I don't think he's made any fires yet. If he has, 
they've been off so much I haven't heard them come by, but like I'm still waiting just to get sniped because I I deserve it if it happened. All right, so where were you born? Uh, Fort Bragg. Because your dad was in the army. Yep. Yep. And and is that where you did you spend any time in Fort Bragg? Do you remember if you spent any time? I don't in Fort remember Bragg? it. No, I don't remember it because it was uh, I was it was seventy six. And then I think by 77, we were in the Mississippi Delta. And was, was he still in the Army? Uh, no, I think he just got out. And then what, was, what did he do once he got out of the Army? Uh, he was a – he was pretty much like Bill Murray. He was a groundskeeper for a golf course <laughs> while he went to college, you know, after getting out of Nam, you know, came back and Bro, went to he college. was like – he was like <laughs> 100%. Bill Murray. 100%. He like, was freaking scoping out gophers and – Wait, this is Caddyshack Bill Murray. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I remember <laughs> – I remember, like, being with him in that golf cart cruising around and he went to and this is stuff i haven't even talked to him about this is just from memory from that long ago but i'm sure he went to delta state in cleveland mississippi my mom worked for baxter Healthcare, and that's why i think we were there and so my dad went to college for psychology and you know i, I remember plugging learning to plug holes on the golf greens and and smoking that first ball washer with the golf cart when I was, I don't even know how old I was. I just know like, you know, my dad being like, bring that golf cart over here. And it was in reverse. And I just stomped on it and just drove over the ball washer. That's the first time karma made a little, that's the first time karma started to go, wait a second, I need to be tracking on this dude. Yeah. I mean, I wonder what my dad would think like, you know, damn, is that a sign? Because like that would have been a that would have been a a real easy one to get to get over. Yeah, because it just I was I was a tornado for a while. <laughs> Where so where'd you do like the bulk of your like when you were in let's say like sixth, seventh, eighth? When you start actually you know figuring out the world and all that, what where are you then? Um, it would have been Illinois. We we were in the Delta until I was seven, I think, and then my mom got transferred up to Northern Illinois um, to work for Baxter, and that's kind of where I grew up. And when I came up there, honestly, I was a little bit rebellious. I'm not really sure why. I just uh, I don't know. It's just what I was into. Like I was a skater, and honestly, there was um, I enjoy skating. I enjoyed like freaking ninja movies and <laughs> <laughs> so I, I like i built ramps and you know and, and people and i was just a, like a punk in northern illinois that you know when when everything was like skate or die and there was you know all these like anti-skate things that was me so yeah at school you know it there there was definitely a little bit of i don't know hate towards skating then and I wasn't like I had no drive athletically I was just wanting to like pierce my ears like play with fireworks you know blow stuff up <laughs> skate this is, around this is how old built um uh, eight to 13 was just like, you know, my first construction job I said was building ramps. I mean, I had ramps all over the place. <laughs> my sister freaking hated them. You how know? good how good at skating were you? Mm, I would say I was just below intermediate. Is it something where how many hours a day were you skating? Like a lot. Yeah, I had Half pipes what was and quarter the, pipes. And what's stuff. up with the stellar level of just below intermediate? Because <laughs> the, the only instruction I had was watching the search for animal chin oh, freaking okay. every day, like in a big box of cereal, and then go out and just try to get after it. So, what at what point or what was it that made you start doing uh, athletics, sports? <laughs> you teeing me up for this? Uh, so. I think when I guess I was, so. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> Is there some weird story? Yeah, because my dad was, I always knew my dad was a super athlete. You know, he was my uncle and, you know, my mom always told me how athletic my dad was. And um, not to mention he was just good at, you know, anything. Like, 
honestly, even the skateboard. He's just like, what's that? And I, oh, I, you know, I'm learning to skate on this half pipe. And he's just like, oh, let me check it out. And then he just do it. You Meanwhile, know. you're just over here driving <laughs> into ball walkers. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, uh, no, I, I, like I said, I liked fireworks and like, you know, blowing stuff up and, you know, one thing led to another and freaking burned my house down at <laughs> 10 years old How uh, or 11, that? maybe 11. You mean literally? Yeah. Yeah. Everything except for what was in my dad's car while he was at work and what was in my mom's car while she was, I think, in Puerto Rico on a business trip. How old were you? I think I was like 11 or 12. How did it happen? Playing with fire, freaking lit some stuff on my bed on fire and then like put it out called my dad and my dad you know he's like did you get it out i said yeah i got it out and he goes is there smoke in the house i go oh yeah there's freaking tons of smoke and he's like open up all the windows he said you know he's like i hate the smell of smoke you know get that shit out of there so i opened up everything and he's like go open up the windows and everything come back and tell me what's going on so I came back to the phone I'm like open up everything it's smoking but the smoke's going out so he talked to me for a little bit and then uh he said well go check on it go back down and check on it and I went down and when I went down it was like engulfed because I just gave it oxygen Mm -hmm. you know I didn't Mm -hmm. like if I would have just like taken that blanket and like you know if he would have just said go throw that blanket out in the yard like game over but you know, I put it out and then freaking fueled, like opened the front door, opened the window and just freaking gave that thing. What were you burning? Like, like matchsticks? Were you burning like what? I think I was uh, just playing flamethrower with a lighter and some aqua net that my sister <laughs> had. <laughs> <laughs> and so it, so the, so the whole house burns down. Oh yeah. Everything. Yeah. Everything. And so it was, I mean, I don't really know what kind of conversation my parents had because they never, uh, they kind of asked what happened or something, you know, but they never like made me feel horrible about it. And then they just let you, I mean, you must have felt like freaking horrible though. Oh, still do. I mean, I laugh about it now, but yeah, like I think about, you know, because like all my dad's, you know, all my dad's military stuff like every picture he had from you know as a child you know like everything we had every single thing i remember it was in the winter so everything like froze like after they put it out and i remember digging through it with my dad you know we were like digging through the thing like a couple days later just trying to see what you can find and I remember we like we were digging and found this like closet that was in right inside our front door and it had like fallen through and the like the glass doors were there. And I remember my dad, you know, shucking the glass doors open and he had a pair of these like lacrosse winter boots and they looked brand new. And I'll never forget how excited like, he's just like, My boots, man. <laughs> he freaking grabbed him and he's just like, My boots are okay. And I and I remember like that was it. Like other than what he had in his the trunk of his car and what he wore it that day, like that was it. So then we, you know, started rebuilding. Naturally, I was a skater, and not to mention, uh, ten years old, I was five foot, one hundred and thirty pounds. So I was like short and fat, yeah. you know, short and chubby, and so you know, short and chubby skater you know, wasn't an athlete. So then, you know, my dad could tell I was, I was bummed out, you know? And so he kept telling me like, you need to go, just go do something, you know, just, you know, go get active, hang out with your friends. Like, you know, he wasn't wanting me to like sit around and get depressed about it. So they talked me into going out to like a school dance or something, you know, and this is whatever, fifth grade or something. I remember going and they, they said like this, Hey, this song's dedicated to to John Dudley, and it was burning down the house. <laughs> Someone had, one of the kids, had oh <laughs> some Jocko over there sent that one my way. That's unfortunately that's exactly what that's exactly my mode when I was a kid to be a little freaking savage. Yeah. So then that's um, amazing though that your parents 
recognized that you p- felt enough guilt on your own without having to just turn the screws on your brain to make you feel even worse about it. Yeah, I don't know if I could have done it. Like, I don't know. I don't know what the conversation was. They've never brought it up. And there's been times where we've talked about the fire. You know, it's kind of how it's referred to. But they've never gone into detail. Like, my dad's never said, like, yeah, man, I knew if I freaking threw that shit on you, you know, it'd crack you or whatever. But what happened was, you know, and, you know, maybe this is just my dad psychology, but uh, what happened was after that dance, my dad knew, like, we need to get this guy out of this town. So we moved about 45 minutes away. And without him ever tell, like, saying anything to me, I knew when I moved, like, I need, I need to freaking make it right with my dad. So that's when I went and started. I'm just like, you know, he's, I know he's always wanted me, me to be an athlete. So, like, I need to get my shit together and start getting into sports. And this is how, how old are you? I think I was because you keep saying like 10, 12, 10, 12. Well, Those, there's a big I difference think, between 10 and 10. Yeah, and 12. I think the I think the fire was when I was 10 and then we probably moved when I was 11. Yeah, because then by when I got into junior high school, that's when I'm like, I'm going to be an athlete. What did it start with? What was the first sport? Uh, basketball. Um, I th- well, yeah, I think basketball, football. You're just all in. Yeah. Basketball, football, running. And then, you know, there was – But never, you, had, you had no experience playing basketball, let's say. My dad always shot hoops. Okay, I mean, so you my, had a little bit of Yeah, experience. a little bit. But then I started growing. So I was like – I remember at 10, I've got this football card, and it says like – it has your stats on the back. Mm-hmm. And I think my grandma gave me that photo because we didn't have any pictures, you know, going back pre-fire. So I was like five foot, 130 pounds. And I was like chubby. Then when I was a freshman, so what is that, 13, mm-hmm. 12, yep. 12, 13? 13, you're a freshman, I think. So then <clears throat> on that on that one, I was 6'3", 130. And then by the time I was senior, I was 6'5", 205. <clears throat> so I just like stretched out and just looked like this Gumby – going up and down the basketball court you know my dad's like i always felt like if you tripped it'd sound like a chandelier breaking across the ground <laughs> <laughs> how much would you pr- like okay so you get into basketball do you start saying because i mean that's that's a for you to make a transition from like hey i'm a skater with freaking whatever you probably had like the tony hawk bangs and stuff like this <laughs> <laughs> hell yeah I did. <laughs> so you had the tony hawk bangs then you're like all right i'm gonna be a basketball player you get a crew cut you start freaking training is it like that kind of are we talking rocky uh what's that thing called <laughs> montage is there a montage, montage going on <laughs> no not really because i still i mean i still liked you know getting in trouble and freaking blowing stuff up and you know ordering fireworks wherever i could or egging some houses or you know whatever kind of mischief (laughs) i stole my mom's uh minivan one time she had this she had this pontiac transport you remember those ones it was like like a wedge like the sloped yeah because um eventually my parents got divorced and i can't remember when it was it was somewhere you know junior high or something like that but my mom traveled a lot and I was home on my own a lot. Um, and so I remember, you know, my mom would have like cars take her to O'Hare. And so I remember one time, like, I'm just going to go take that van out for a rip, you know, and I'm <laughs> like seven. All the grade. ball washers in, you know, all in Illinois went on standby. Up. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm driving around, you know, seventh grade, just driving around my town in this minivan and one of my buddies was on his bike, like driving down the road. <laughs> so I pull over. I'm like, what's up, man? And he's just like, holy shit, did you steal a car? I'm like, yeah, it's my mom's. <laughs> and he's just like, oh, and, you know, and I I thought I could drive pretty decent because I had uh, – my dad would never let me get, like, motorcycles or anything for obvious reasons. <laughs> but he let me get a boat. He got me a, a 12-foot Boston Whaler with a 25 horse on it. Oh, so that's, like, I put 
a thousand miles on that freaking thing, dude. I mean, my dad would fill up that little five gallon five gallon gas can, and uh, the Fox River chain was only a block from my house. We live like right on a channel, so I just drove that boat all the time. So. To me, the minivan was gravy, <laughs> right? No current, <laughs> you know, didn't have trim tilt. Like this was, it wasn't a pull start. This was freaking gravy. But uh, I'm sitting there talking to this this kid, and I see someone coming up behind me in the mirror. So I said, I go, hold on, I'll let me freaking whip over, you know. And I remember putting it in reverse and trying to, like, do a little, you know, whip in. But that long beak on the front of that freaking <laughs> minivan, I ended up swiping this dude's, like, back pegs and, like, took him out underneath, like, the front of the car and, like, bent the back of his bike up a lot. So then I ended up having to, you know, trade him, like, my good bike. I had a GT, you know. Oh, I had yeah. to trade him, like, a good oh, yeah. freaking <laughs> a good bike. For the Huffy. <laughs> yeah, for this freaking Huffy that he had. And and I'm just like, you're not going to say nothing? He said no. But, you know, looking back, you know, if any of our kids <laughs> rolled in with a brand new freaking GT, you yeah, know, yeah. with the gyro on it, freaking <laughs> pegs on the front and back, you'd be like, hey, whose bike did you steal? So anyway, you know, fast forward a day, I'm narked out. You know, always. <laughs> Always happened. That kid broke, bro. He broke big time. His dad's like, where the hell did you get that bike? He's like, he got me, he hit me. <laughs> Drove over me in the car. Yeah, it was just, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Then you hear like, wait, John Dudley, that little kid was driving his mom's car. I'm going over there right now. Yeah. yeah. I don't think anyone wanted to get close because, yeah, I mean, I had, I had freaking straight bangs down here, slung it. And, uh, yeah, just, I think, I think when I got into sport there, and originally I didn't want to really play football. I was supposed to play golf. Like my dad said, don't play football. You're not, you know, you're too brittle, go play golf. And when I went to the high school, like the tough kid in school came up to me and goes, Hey, what are you going out for? Cause I was standing in the line and He's, and he said, I go, I'm going out for golf. He's like, no, you're going out for football. And I said, no, I'm going out for golf. I have to do golf. And I remember he said, uh, well, we need enough guys to scrimmage. And he said, you know, I'm quarterback. So he's like, you're signing up for football or I'm going to beat your ass. So I freaking signed up for football and never told my dad, for, like, until he saw me in the paper. Be what, do you, what do you see you in the paper for? Well, because I ended up becoming quarterback – and like taking that kid's job. So How, he was saying, I would take my golf clubs to school because I'd say like, he's like, how's golf? And I'm, it's all right. But I was playing football because I kind of had to. And I started out as like defensive end and then tight end. And then I think I like chucked a football back. You know, I think I caught a pass and like went in the end zone and then the coach is like hey throw the ball back and i think i just freaking <laughs> just hucked it <laughs> and he's just like whoa you know wait a minute so yeah just one thing led to another and um just i think i think i loved i don't know just the constant challenge it, it's hard to describe but it's like if i know i'm not good at something which I really had never fueled that, then it didn't keep me coming. Like I'd get bored with it. But if I, if I wasn't good at it or if I knew that I had room for improvement, then, it, then that's the things that I progressed at. But it just kind of got to the point where no matter really what the sport was, I felt like I could do it above average. And then I honestly, like my body started to change. So it went from like me being like the short, fat, skater to now I'm you know second tallest kid in the school and and growing and you know becoming an asshole you know just kind of being you're just growing up just being like overly confident you know but I felt I just felt so much confidence just it was like gas just sports for me was just gas because it's like oh you want to do track okay I go do track what did you do in track um High jump, triple jump. Whatever I wanted. Pretty much, <laughs> honestly. Uh, 100, 200, 400. 
And you did good at all of them. Yeah, I mean, I did for my team. Yeah, I did good. Did you? Did the coaches like try and keep you focused on one thing? I think, you, you um like the idea that some people have that the best thing to do with their kid is put them in one sport when they're four years old yeah, and just keep them focused on. Me. And then other people are like, hey, have your kids play a bunch of different sports and it's going to make them more well-rounded in the end. Well, it's in a way you look at it like functional fitness now. It's proven that, you know, if I would have had more functional fitness in my lifestyle, I would be feeling a little bit better today than I did pre-surf. You know, for the first time with you, Um, because like some of my stuff is smoked probably because it's not like functional fitness. And I'm I'm a you know, I feel like the reason I still today do good at just random things I pick up is because, you know, in when you do different sports, you also get street smarts in athletics. You know, and that's the thing. Like there's book smart people and then there's street smarts people. And as like an employer. I, you know, I'm not, I don't look for a degree. I look for work ethic and I look for someone that, you know, when they pull up and I look in their car, it's not a freaking wreck. It's not trashed, you know, and I look for people that have certain types of work ethic qualities, because for me as an athlete, I feel like even though I wasn't like the pinnacle of all these different sports, I also learned different mechanics and different like, you know, physical smarts from doing a lot of things. And I always, I always wanted to do good enough at it to where I felt like I could put it down and pick it up and still like represent it well. You know, if I felt like I, if I did it and look like an idiot in front of people, I'd want to do it more until I could get it figured out. But my son, you know, coming from England, he was into soccer first. So he came over and, you know, he played soccer quite a bit. But over here, soccer is like a one season thing. So once he got into junior high, you know, he tried football and I realized that just wasn't his thing. You know, it, it just wasn't, you know, getting hit and stuff just wasn't his thing but he was like always fast you know he's always fast and and he likes i mean he he performs at his highest if especially when he knows someone's pumped about the fact that he just did good so uh i ended up talking him into swimming because he did um let's see he did soccer. I knew soccer was coming up. We talked him into cross country, and he didn't really like the people. Love the coach, awesome coach. And then I talked him into going into swimming, went into swimming, swimming had a, a freaking awesome instructor, military dude, um, super disciplined, swam like honestly for how young he was. I was like, okay, these guys are crazy. <laughs> Two days, like Sharon's getting up at 4.30, having him to the pool at 515 they they'd do an hour practice and then shower and then she'd get him home to feed him before we'd take him to junior you know whatever high mm-hmm. school or but you know whichever so he had a pretty like awesome schedule i thought you know i'm like this guy and he was getting straight a's which i don't ever remember taking a book home like I didn't, I don't even remember being assigned books. Yeah, part know? of it was different back then, bro. It was different back then. Like I mean, like I didn't do I, like I see my kids. My kids will have, and they're older now. But when they were in school, it was like homework every day from day one, from like kindergarten on through high school. Hours and hours and hours of homework. I never did homework. Homework was not a thing. Nope. And, and I, I. Wait, now let me rephrase that. It was a thing. It did exist. I knew that it was a thing in existence, but it wasn't a thing that I was doing, <laughs> right? It wasn't like, oh, it's, you know, it's the afternoon. I'm going to do homework now. It was like the afternoon. I'm going to throw rocks at shit. Like, <laughs> yes. That was that was where I was at. So what, what sports did you end up playing? Because I know, I like you rattled off one time to me, you're like, oh, I did freaking wrestling. I did basketball. I did football. I did baseball. I did tennis. I did freaking, you did everything. Yeah. Well, you just named them all. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I did, I did quite a bit. I wrestled a year, um, mainly because I did basketball, really didn't like the coach and just, I'm like, I freaking hate this guy. 
So then I went and wrestled. And coming into wrestling as a sophomore, and we had a really good wrestling school too. Like both the Guidas are from. That's right. Yeah, yeah you so, told me that. Yeah, so like Jason was my guard, and and Clay was um, a little bit younger. But you know, we had a. Really How fired up was Clay Guida when he was fourteen? <laughs> Because, dude. dude, he's 30-whatever right now, and he's still fired up. Let me just tell you, Clay was – or, uh, well, Jason was – Jason was, like, on a Clay level, but, like, more like more of a gorilla. You know, Clay gives Jason a lot of credit for, for being a savage, and trust me, he was. Um, every game, he, like – before every game, he'd take a mouthpiece out of a packet and we'd put it on his helmet. And then he was like my pulling guard. And I remember like by fourth quarter, I'd be like grabbing his mask. I'd normally like grab his face mask to, to like call plays. And I'd look and it would just be like the plastic piece, like, because he would chew. He would just chew. He would eat them. Like he would eat a savage. full mouthpiece <laughs> and his eyeballs were like this big around. And Wait, I, this is Jason or Clay? Jason. Yeah, Jason. And I remember, uh, I remember one time, like, him and, him and his brother lived in a, a part of town that was like, you know, um, I don't know. There's a lot of savages over that way. You know, there's like a lot of like wrestlers came from that group of town. There's a lot of badasses mm-hmm. over there. And I remember one time like uh, Jason came to practice and he was kind of pissed because he was like chainsawing something on his garage and the chainsaw kicked back and hit him in the top of the head and like chainsawed his head <laughs> open. God. And dude, he just threw his football helmet on and freaking <laughs> got after it. Dude, like that right there. I was just on a uh, on Jason, Jordan Peterson. Jason and I wrestled the same the same weight class, which was what I think one seventy one mm-hmm. in our sophomore year. But he was like way better. I was just on a uh, Jordan Peterson's podcast a little while ago, and he was like talking to me. And I was like talking about how like when you're a young kid, and it's not everybody, but you just want to like fight and go. And, and that's what I picture when you picture him just gnawing apart his freaking mouthpiece and his eyes are all big. This kid needs to go to combat somewhere. Like, that's what he's meant to do. And he did. <laughs> and, he, and he did. So, uh, so you wrestled for what, a year? Yeah, I wrestled for a year. But it's, and look, then I, I don't care how good of an athlete you are, you roll into wrestling. And did you not just get, like, crushed? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't catch up. You know, no, I wrestled. Kids that are, I, yeah, I wrestled. Uh, I wrestled JV, and I mean, they were that we were a wrestling school. Like, you know, we we had we had a, some really good wrestling coaches, and yeah, it was it was tough. It was tough, but I really I was still like getting into my body, honestly, because I, I stretched up so high, and so I didn't have a lot of coordination, but I had work ethic. You know, that's one of the things before, like, before I go down that route, like with multi-sport thing with my son, he did swimming after cross country. And then when he got to soccer, like he started, the coach wasn't playing him, but at practice, this, this coach was taking weeks to try to condition the other player, but Harry would be out there just running circles around people because he just got off of cross country followed by swim season followed by now it's soccer season you're just running around out on some grass you know so he for him it was nothing and i i remember after like three or four games of watching the coach just bypass him i kind of pulled the coach to the side after practice and i said hey i said is there anything i should be working with harry on so he can get more game time and he just said well i don't like single player you know he said I want soccer players. Harry's too distracted with other sports. And I was just like, really? Mm. You know, I said, I deal with a lot of coaches on pretty high levels. And I said, I've never known a coach to not want an athlete on the team. I'm like, this this kid's an athlete. Mm Mm-hmm. An athlete as opposed to a sports-specific one-trick, one-trick pony. Yeah. Um, 
And so, yeah, right then I just kind of told Harry, like, I don't think soccer's your thing. So he went into track and, you know, did cross country track and swam four years, even though he didn't like it, you know, still did it. And then, you know, ended up going to college to run and, and still gets awesome grades and runs and does all that stuff. And he's kind of like, like I was, but a little bit later, he's like now getting into his, into his body Mm -hmm. to where, and he's also hit a new gear of competitiveness, which is really cool to see because I hit that way earlier. You know, I would get probably what held me back athletically is I would get really pissed off. You know, it's like once I started to compete, I had never been taught the management of like, you know, raging out when you like made a bad play or threw an interception or something. And that, that actually transpired all the way into my archery career. And then luckily, um, an Olympic coach like helped that. That was a big turning point in my career, like in my twenties when I got taught like how to get, you know, how to not let the arrows in my quiver that haven't been shot yet be affected by the ones that already have and that you can't get back. You know, that's kind of how it was put to me. So that really helped. But in high school, I think um, by the time I hit, you know, junior and senior year, I just started to, I just started to feel way more confident in what I was doing. And, you know, size wise, you know, I was a totally different person than, than what I was. So what ended up being like the sport? Football for sure. Yeah. Football was was the sport and for me um i've always struggled with sleep you know i've always just you know been an insomniac and i also one of the things that kept me awake was knowing if someone else was like having more time to train than me so you know i was welcome to my world (laughs) yeah so i was like in high school by my senior year you know, I was like substituting any non-elective class that I had or all my study halls for like extra gym. So I'd go to like four gym classes. And then I had <laughs> my my football coach gave me a key to the to the gymnasium. So when I couldn't sleep at night and my mom would be gone, you know, I was home I was home alone a lot. You know, I had my mom would just sign a checkbook for me to like order Domino's, you know. And Whenever I woke up, I'd go to the high school, go in there, and I had, you know, my coach gave me this huge bag of footballs when I was a sophomore and just said, like, these are yours until you graduate. And so I'd just go to the gym and I'd pull the laundry baskets, you know, out of the locker rooms, and I'd just throw, you know, from corner of the gym to corner of the gym. I'd just run, like, three-step drills and just, like, run 73 passes into those or then into garbage cans or then eventually just like throwing into the basketball hoop and then just doing like three step drops, five step drops, seven step drops, rollouts and just, and then it got to the point where it's like I memorized what I needed to do, but then I memorized what the linemen need to do. And then, you know, like every player on the field, it's like, this is, you know, I knew the playbook front and back. And how good, how good was your team? Sucked. Horrible. How'd you guys do senior year? Horrible. You know, just really underperformed. At all the camps, we were awesome because at camps. Well, how should you have done? I mean, were you from like a weak school, a weak football school? Or no. were you from a good football school and you guys were just playing shitty? No, you know, it. it it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like when you, I forget what podcast it was, but or maybe it's in your book when you were talking about um, through Buds, there were the two teams with the two yeah. different boats. Yep. You know, I remember like one of the sayings my football coach always would have, where he'd be like, you know, bring the boat in. You know, he always would say like the boat's lost. He's like, it's your job to bring the boat in, you know, and he was like. Your oh, job meaning you, John yeah, Dudley. Yeah. Because you're I, the quarterback. Yeah. I was responsible for every mistake we made. You know, if we screwed around and practice got shut off early, he would he would like pull me back and tell me like, you're going to run laps for – Every person here that screwed off today and today there was, you know, we freaking 46 minutes early we quit practice. I want 46 laps. You know, it'd be like stuff like that. But we had a small group of people for like seven-on-seven camps that were at all the – they were at all the camps. 
they I would call them and say, let's go practice. But there was – and we at seven on seven, we were great. But there was, you know, four other people mm-hmm. that weren't being included and then the entire defense. So we were just – we had really good – pieces but nothing ever like flowed as a team did you did you do good enough did you get looked at by colleges yeah i think the first college i I think the first college that looked at me was ball state when i was a sophomore i remember at the end of my sophomore year i went to ball state with my mom and that was like that lit a totally different fire because then i realized like you know i'm gonna i'm gonna go somewhere and so you know i my dad, even though my parents were split, my dad was at every freaking game. And he was quite a ways, you know, he kind of moved to a different town. Um, but he came to every game. And, yeah, I mean, my life was was sport. Was sport and training. I mean, I loved, I loved lifting I, camps. Like in the summertime, it was every football camp I could sign up for. And, honestly, my mom's like, you know, she was so – you know, involved with with her position at, at Baxter to where she's like, yeah, if you want to, you know, go somewhere for a month in the summer, do it, you know, because I think she probably just, you know, was managing plants in Puerto Rico or Singapore or wherever the heck, you know, she was for her job. So um, I just – I did not miss an opportunity to, like, go to a camp or something like that. So did you actually get recruited to go when you, in your senior year? To go yeah. to college, somewhere? yeah, there was several, and I I ended up choosing. Um, I wanted to go back. My dad was moving back to North Carolina. My uncle was in North Car- Carolina, and one of the uh, coaches at Western Carolina played uh, with my dad, and you know we ended up going out there, and it was kind of a decision that I would be close to to the Dudley family Mm -hmm. out that way. And I liked the idea of like getting, honestly, I never really felt like that town was home, you know, and maybe it's because like, you know, my parents were kind of always split. Mm -hmm. I saw my mom limited, you know, when she wasn't traveling, but we like, we traveled away from like me and my mom were together more when we'd go places. Cause she'd say, Hey, you know, I've got a, I've got a meeting in Salt Lake for two days. Do you want to come with me? And I'd say, oh, can I go to – I've been wanting to check out Snowbird. And she's just like, yeah, you know. So we'd fly out there, and she'd say, the bus will pick you up in the morning at 7, and they'll bring you back to – you know, just make sure you're back here at this time. So I'd just go up, and and then I started, you know, skiing, shredding, loved skiing, worked at a little ski hill up there and skied bumps, like, all the time in the the wintertime. And – cool so then what what happened with college then <clears throat> so i was going to play football and like the one thing that i haven't talked about was back at age 10 <laughs> when i was a super punk um my uncle and my grandfather got me into like hunting deer when we'd go down to mississippi we'd go back down there to see family for thanksgiving and so, you know, they were like, you know, we need to get you out in the woods. And my grandpa was all, you know, Korean War veteran. And he's like, you know, we need to make a man of you because I'm showing up with freaking Tony Hawk haircut and freaking <laughs> earrings and, you know, stuff Damn. like that. Stuff like that. So he's out there, you know, th- making me sit in fire ant beds and, you know, just trying to, like, make a man out of this freaking softy that's coming down. And so, you know, I got into hunting and just loved it. Like it was and, – and honestly, probably because it was hard and it like took a ton of patience and it was very different from being able to just screw off, you know. And, and so it was, it was the first kind of form of competition in a way, just that it took a lot of moving parts to be successful. So, you know, when I got my first deer – it, it was like winning my first trophy, right? I mean, I was totally hooked at how freaking awesome it was. And just seeing my family like, oh, my gosh, you got a deer. And then we ate it and everything, you know, and it was just this 
thing. So every year for Thanksgiving, I was looking forward to going back home and doing that. And I got into bow hunting, I think, when I was – the first year I hunted, with, I, they gave me – I had a gun. And then um, when I was 10 is when I started shooting a bow and bow hunting. So that was – once a year that was happening, but then I got a little bit better um, towards the end of my senior year. I was shooting a lot more around home, like I was practicing and stuff a lot because, again, I had a lot of free time. You know, my mom would be gone. Mm-hmm. You had no and, homework. <laughs> yeah, no, no homework. If I wasn't, like, cutting grass, like, you know, for five bucks a lawn, then that's what I was doing. But uh, I ended up uh, – driving down this road i actually had hurt my knee so i was i was i moved into college a little bit early um and hurt my knee and then i I forget what happened but i i was at home back by my mom's for some reason i was just driving around on this like a back road and I think I was coming. I think so I went, you went to college. Yeah, I was. You're I moved to... in. I moved in, and I'm talking like there a week, maybe, oh, okay. maybe a week and a half. And you and on a you, weekend, you I, hurt your knee at some point. Yeah, and so yeah. you're not really able to play. Yeah, and so I for did, whatever reason, you go back home. Yeah, we did some. We did some like run throughs. I know I did some stuff with like, you know, I remember wearing like pants, jersey, helmet. You know, just doing like dry runs and stuff. But I wasn't. I, I don't I never like hit really hit helmets you know in college mm-hmm. and so it was the weekend I went back and saw my mom and then I drove I think I went up to the ski hill just to you know go up there and say hi to some people that worked up in the summer and on my way back I took some back roads back home and I went by this uh, little town called Ringwood and I saw this sign on the on the side of the road that just said archery shoot like spray painted on a board and just had an arrow like pointing that way. So I went down that road and I'm like, what's this all about? You Damn. know? Yeah. I had my I went down this road. Yes, you did. Yep. <laughs> yes, you did, bro. <laughs> went down the road and I said, what's this all about? And they're like, Oh, we got a, you know, 40 target course. And you know, here's how the scoring works on the animal, you know, those 3d animal targets. I had never seen 3d animal targets. I had always like, shot at bales of hay and stuff like that. So I went out and freaking halfway through the course, I was out of arrows. I had freaking (laughs) shot the woods down. And I remember leaving the course, got in my car, went back up to Wilmot, Wisconsin, uh, which was where the ski hill was, but there's also a Gander Mountain Outlet store there. Went in and bought more arrows, like in a rage, and went back to finish the because I didn't want to not finish the course. So I bought more arrows to go back to finish. And by the time I like finished, everything was pretty much done, and they were having the award ceremony. And the guys that were up on that podium all had these shirts that had like their local shop on the shirt. So I remember this was on a Sunday and. On Monday morning, like when they, I think they opened at one o'clock, but at one o'clock, I was at that shop. Just like, when are those guys coming in that, you know, won this weekend? And and I just started standing there and watching these people shoot and ask questions. And I was there a few days just kind of being a stalker. And, (laughs) and the owner of the archery shop, uh, called me to the side said hey kid what are you what are you doing I said I'm just I'm watching I'm watching and he said well come in the back room I need you for a minute and he took me in the back room and he said I forgot to get this guy's arrows done he goes have you ever built arrows and I said no sir and he goes okay well here's how you do it and he said you know you're going to clean this feather like this then you're going to put the glue on it and you put it in this clamp and then you stick it down and he's like, you know, set this timer and then move on to this next jig and do a second arrow. And then when you get to the six, you can go back to the first. If the timer's gone off, you rotate it. And so I just sat in this room and fletched this guy's arrows and then kind of came out. And I said, like, I got him, you know. So he came out and gave the guy his arrows. And um, the guy just said, all right, do those ones. 
and he had just this buckets of arrows that needed to get done. So I just started fletching arrows, and then the next day he's like, have you ever worked on a bow? And I said, no, I haven't. And he's like, all right, well, let me show you how to change a string. And, you know, and then he's like, hey, if, you know, if, they're, if these bows are here for maintenance, you know, here's the checklist. You got to, you know, clean these axles. You got to wax a string and melt it in with this. And just started showing me. And honestly, after probably two weeks of doing that, um, I I ended up telling the guy, I said, hey, am I going to get a paycheck? <laughs> <laughs> and he's just like, I remember uh, the guy's name was Mike Donovan. Some people in the archery industry, like old timers, they still remember him because he was, he was a pretty hardcore uh, archery manager at the time. But he goes, you can't put value on what I'm teaching you right now. And I, I remember I'm like, no, sir, you can't. But I can't put gas in my tank, you know, with experience. So he uh, he's like, I'll give you four ten an hour. And I'm just like, oh, yeah. You know, I was freaking pumped. And I remember going home to my dad and – I went to my Home dad's. to North Carolina or whatever? Well, my dad at that time, I think, was, yeah, he was still in Rockford, Illinois. And I remember telling my dad, um, hey, I, I'm not going to go to college to play ball because I've, get, you know, I've got this archery thing going, and it's, it's, a good, it's good. He's like, you're like, Dad. Four ten an hour. I did. He, because I remember. You know, again, well, he's always been super logical, <laughs> and he's also like tried to not. He never really told me like at that point. He had never said like what's wrong with you or you know that's a terrible decision. But in that instance, he's like, I I really feel like you need to make your own decisions and you need to know like what to do. He said, but. I have to say, I think this is a terrible decision. And uh, I think for my 40th birthday, he wrote me this really long birthday card. And, like, in there he said, he's like, you could have not done a better job of proving me wrong. Mm -hmm. Because he's like, he goes, goes, I I can't believe, I can't believe what you've done in, like, 22 years type thing, you know. Hey, what when you went to that uh, 3D shoot for the first time on the on the side of the road or whatever? What do you think it? What feeling did you have? What was it that just freaking was like this is it? I, uh, yeah, like I listened to Ted Nugent on Rogan and mm-hmm. like he gives some crazy description of like launching an arrow. It's all poetic and everything. Yeah, <laughs> well, did you, is that what you you were just like? No, nope, never had that. For me. It was, I couldn't, like, the fact that I knew it, that was a, that showed me how inferior I was with a bow and arrow, and I loved hunting, and it showed me that there was every person that was in that parking lot was a lot better than me, and that was a problem. And and that 100% was, you know, I had to go to the shop, I had to learn, and then it's like, I'm not going to leave until I beat these guys. Mm -hmm. These guys that are winning, like, I need to beat them. And then once I did that, it was, you know, I remember I I did really well, did well fast. And I remember going to a shoot that was about 45 minutes away to the north. And I remember going in there and my name was, like, written down on a piece of paper that was, like, at this registration desk. And these are rinky dink sh- like local shoots mm-hmm. you know i don't know if like you have like local surf tournaments where mm-hmm. it's not like yeah you know so i just said oh what's up with that name you got right there and they're like oh uh this guy is supposed to be a serious cheater so when he comes we're gonna send someone out with him and i go oh well that's me who's coming <laughs> and Wait, so they were thinking this because you had been doing well in these yeah, other tournaments? Yeah, because I kind of came from nowhere. So uh, these these people that that was their thing, um, they're just like, where did this guy come from? Who who even is he? You know, they'd never seen me even at a local club, you know, because I was just nothing. And then went, as I always do, you know, oh, I'm not good at this. Then just like head first 
into the deep end. Like, were you I'm, shooting arrows at night, waking up in the morning, shooting arrows? Oh, like, yeah. we just full on, full oh, on yeah. obsession immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, had to like sat around after tournaments and would like take down courses for places if they'd give me a target. So I'd have another target, you know, or, you know, I would freaking cut grass or clean the bottoms of people's boats or whatever so I could buy another target. And then, you know, I had to have an entire range to practice on. And then it just, you know, and then I wanted like a colored target bow. And then it just, it's just like, it's me. It's just me. It's who I am all the time. I just, you know, I had to like, I had to get good at it. But then there came a point where, um, and actually at that tournament was kind of a turning point because this is the cheater one. Yeah. So I went out, did, I ended up winning that tournament and they had someone like writing score. And I said, um, I go, well, that was kind of nice. Just having someone else keep score. I'm like, hopefully you'd keep score for these other guys that have a problem, you know, cause it's called like pencil pushing, you know? And they just said, well, if you don't want to deal with that, you could always go to nationals where there's two scorekeepers. And so I'm just like, where's that? So then I went to the national triple crown and slept in the back of my truck and, you know, shot at that and sucked at it horribly. But then the next year, you know, I, instead of going like two, I went to all of them, drove to all of them and just got better and got better. And then within like five years, I was at a level that was, you know, that I was happy with, but I was also still refining it, you know, just there's, that's what's cool about archery is I think the reason I'm still doing it is because, you know, I still find if I'm not centered, then it shows. So it's hard, like you're never going to have a perfect game to where you can just back away and know that like, okay, that was a Cinderella story. I'm done. Cause you can go have a perfect round, but then an hour later <laughs> have something. Say, You've got to shoot another one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. How do you cheat in archery? Well, I mean, there's just, there's groups where, you know, if at, at like a local tournament, they're not going to send a scorekeeper out. So let's just say like we all went out with our wife. There's definitely people that, you know, they would shoot down there and score like an eight, but they'd just like write a 10. And meanwhile, like the wives and kids are just like not giving a crap about what's going on. But then you just turn in your scorecard and, you know, just. But once you get into like the professional events, there's two people that keep score. The majority of the group has to agree on the arrow call. Um, and then if there's ever a divide, then you call an official scorekeeper to come and call it, which is kind of a big reason why I liked progressing um, because once I was shooting like internationally, you know, they had like, you couldn't even have an arrow judge that was from your country. So if you, you know, it's like if an American needed an arrow call, someone would come over, like a, an official judge from a, another country would come over because obviously now there's teams competing against teams. So, you know, these judges had schooling on how to call an arrow and, mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that. So how does that go? Like, you know, I enter the tournament and then what? I just shoot them at my own pace kind of thing and keep my own score. I like, think what's uh, what might be confusing you, Echo, is like the first tournaments that he's talking about are just like kind of like local It'd be like Just you going to Balboa. It's like going to like a little jiu-jitsu tournament somewhere and there's not like judges. You know uh -huh. what I'm saying? Where a jiu-jitsu tournament, like an in-house jiu-jitsu tournament. Like when you have, like at Victory, you have an in-house jiu-jitsu tournament. There's no like escalating the call that the point keep, you know, it's like, hey man, you lost, whatever you did, good. Yeah. Someone could be like, oh yeah, you, no, you're not getting points on that sweep. So these are just like local little tournaments where you go out and you score and you're like, you know, my, my eight's pretty close to a 10. You know, I'm going to give it to myself. So there's no one watching or yeah, anything? Yeah, because it's just like – you, you, you Because you're like on a path through like through this course to where it's not like golf. Like professional golf, there'd be like a crowd following right. like those leaders through that course, which in professional archery, like that happens. 
Um, and then once you get into shooting in the finals, a lot of times it's like on monitors and everything. So obviously people can see on a big screen mm. where the arrows are landing. So, I mean, it's probably the same in competitive like rifle and stuff like that. Yeah, it's the same in competitive anything. <laughs> like really, like when you're at a local tournament or it, whether it's freaking bowling, you know, like over the line, you know, market zero, they're just having an argument, you know, it's like you can cheat. And then, but then you turn in like a score card or something. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. so when you shoot, you you score however many points, you, and then you write it on the card. Then you yeah. go what to the next target or yep. something, and then you go through a course. Yeah. And at the end, you turn in the card. Yeah, it'd be like you playing cribbage with someone at home, and then all of a sudden you're like, "Oh, I won." They're like, "Well, wait a minute, I, dude, we have to be at least even." You're like, "No, it's keeping score." Like, here's how it looks. <laughs> or you go to Vegas and play cribbage, and like it, you know. Everything you're doing is under, a, you know, a magnifying yeah, glass type thing. So at what point did you make the transition or was it the whole time from like 3D archery to target archery? Um, I got, I honestly got a little bit bored in 3D archery pretty fast. And part of the, th- part of what I didn't like about it, there was just, I felt like I was going to the same places all the time because there was, I'm trying to think. I turned pro in 98. So by like 2003, I just felt like I would land, know how to get to the shoot without even like, wouldn't even need to like look at a map. I'd just know where to go. And then you go to these courses and it would be like, well, a lot like, you know, we shot Big Sky together, Mm -hmm. you know, for the Total Archery Challenge. And we've shot the same course because it ends in a good place, you know? Um, But there's certainly targets that you, like you would be like, oh, last year we had the white bunny right Right. here, you know? And so it got to the point where it was like that. I was going to places where I'm, you know, 26 or 30 weekends a year, I'm traveling to, to do tournaments. And it just felt super repetitive. And in the end, I realized there's probably 10 or 12 people that are fully capable of winning like any weekend, but it's almost like if you had that same tournament, you know, two consecutive days over and over and over again, there's probably like five that would win it differently each of those times. And I don't know, it just came, it, it just got to be stale for me. I got, you know, I just really got bored with that. And It got to the point where I pretty much had it set in my mind of I'm a target archer to be a better bow hunter, you know, and that was like my mentality is I was just, I could barely be focused by the time the world championships rolled around in August. I barely cared because I just wanted to be hunting in September and you know, that I, it, the hunting was always the focus for me and it was like I almost I got more out of it so you know I just eventually I did what I needed to do in competitive archery to like help me build a platform to where I really wanted to go which is I've always liked to to coach you know and 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 I've always liked really good coaches you know I've liked I'm the type of person where I liked coaches that like, honestly that like yelled at me and were like Harry's had coaches where you know Sharon said that guy's just a dick like I'd I kind of think I would love that guy Mm -hmm. you know if he like grabbed my face mask and he's yelling at me like it would make me do better on the next play whereas now as an adult I've learned there's certain people where if you did that you're not getting that result. <laughs> you're <a> freaking breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so wait a second. So you're doing the target archer thing, and then, or sorry, you're doing the 3D thing. Then you start doing target archery. Like, and well, like, at what point are you part of Team USA, and you're putting on the Team USA stuff? Dang man, I don't like have my whole life outlined. So um, I had retired. I you know I got sick of it. I retired. And I was working at a bow manufacturer, you know, didn't go back to that. But at 18, um, you know, I started working for this archery shop, didn't like the one-on-one experience that that archery shop owner was giving people buying new equipment. And 
I was spending a lot of time with people, and so I got called in, and he told me, you know, hey, do not spend that much time with people when they buy new gear. If they go over 15 minutes, they need to be paying coaching time per hour. Hmm. And I just said, well, this, you know, no one was in the shop, and I didn't have anything else to do. Why wouldn't we help this guy out? And I remember he said, well, if you want to run a business that way, then you need to go – start your own archery shop so i just thought oh okay (laughs) and so i went and started my own archery shop um about 45 miles away at it was actually our my family had a had a horse ranch in southern wisconsin at the time my mom and my sister so i ended up uh building a pole building there and starting my own shop and that was the same time i started shooting professionally and then got offered a job from a bow manufacturer to move to northern Wisconsin to, you know, come in as like an early sales rep. So I ended up working for this bow company and competing. So, I mean, my life was archery, archery, 20, hour, and archery. 20 hours a day. And then I kind of got burned out with it. And I found myself liking going fishing or going hunting or just doing something that wasn't like training, training, training for archery. And then, um, I had retired for like a few months and then retired I, from, I kind of just said, I'm not going to shoot professionally anymore. And I just stepped away and I was doing some coaching at like, I was doing a lot for some different like youth camps and mm-hmm. stuff. Um, and I remember, seeing another archer at like at a trade show and he and he said something about you know i heard you're not shooting anymore and i just said yeah i got you know bored with it and i kind of just jokingly said you know maybe i'll come over to target archery because 3d archery is all like foam animal targets Mm -hmm. with molded in scoring rings um ranging from you know the size of a dime you know up to like what would be considered just the vitals which would be bigger uh, but like then tar- dinner, like a dinner plate size yeah but then for target archery there's several different formats and that's bullseyes you know with scoring rings but a lot of different games to play right you know there's tons of different formats of shooting at a bullseye target different distances some you don't know the distance you have to estimate it some have like multiple sized faces some are certain amount of arrows at this distance certain amount at that distance that distance but anyway i i said to this guy um yeah maybe i'll just i don't know maybe i should just try target archery and i remember um he looked at me and goes come on in the water's fine oh <laughs> famous last word <laughs> and that was it <laughs> i was like okay when's the first tournament and the first he told me the first tournament was um at the arizona cup in uh at the ben avery did you ever shoot at the ben avery center in arizona uh so that was the first one and ended up you know ended up in the medal you know gold medal match with that guy at that event with that guy with that guy (laughs) in your first event yeah that one and i showed up like everything i had was wrong because, you know, there's – I don't know how to describe it. It would be like if you did, you know, tact, you know, tactical competition and then someone asked you to go to a sniper event and then you, like, showed up with your M4 or yeah, something. Yeah. You know, I don't know. No, it's, but, it's, it's mission specific. Yeah. They're both archery, but one of them has – like you're standing around, you got more time to shoot or whatever, less time to shoot. Your just gear is going to be different the whole nine yards. Yeah. So I remember uh, right before that medal match, um, and as it happened, I was low in the brackets. He was, you know, very high in the brackets, but we were on opposite ends of the brackets. And so at this center, you know, there's, a, you know, it's, let's say it's a hundred yards wide. I was like at this end and he was at that end. And as you shoot against someone and go through the brackets, you just come to the middle. Mm -hmm. So like when I won my semifinal match, I remember like looking over and I, you know, I saw that he won and I'm like, okay, here we go. And he comes over and he said, man, he's like, how I see, he said, how, how are you dealing with it? And I said, dealing with what? And he said, uh, 
well, I've won this nine times and, you know, everyone wants me to lose. And he said, so I can imagine like, you know, the pressure you're feeling, you know, being that guy. And I said, man, I, th- I see it the other way. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, dude, I'm out here. My equipment's a joke. <laughs> I said, I'm out here. I'm a 3D shooter. I got the wrong freaking bow. I got the wrong arrows. Never even shot this far. And I said, and I'm getting ready to roll up on you. <laughs> and, I, and I'm like, you won this nine <laughs> times? And honestly, I could see like that was, you know, that cracked him. And I ended up getting the gold medal there. Oh, you! so the, the first time you won it. <laughs> yeah. That's freaking nuts. So then I guess that pretty much kicked off your target archery career. Yeah, yeah. So we um, – and there was a lot of mis- – like that kicked off my target archery. So I did one type, then I did another type, and then I went into field archery, which is my favorite. It's kind of like the tack but with, with different size bullseyes. And granted – you know, in the pro class, these guys aren't missing. It's like you need perfect scores. You know, you really do. And I went to this field, um, this field tournament, and just sucked at it because half of it is marked, the other half is unmarked. Mm, so you unmarked have, meaning unknown distance. Unknown distance, which in archery is a problem if you don't know the distance because your arrow is w- way slower than a bullet. So, um. I wasn't good at it and ended up buying myself an entire field round and like, you know, reading up on, you know, target faces and then ended up figuring out a mathematical formula to estimate distances using like the circles in my scope and the circles of the bullseye. Mm -hmm. So I'd like frame the side of my scope to the edge of the target. And then I memorized where my center dot would be based on the rings and just memorized a, a gauging, a distance gauging formula, which is what everybody does, but most people keep it secretive on how, you know, what their system is. Um, but because the targets are all regulation, they have to be the same size, mm-hmm. you can figure it out. So then um, I got good at that, you know, and, and that was kind of my favorite. And then, you know, made, made a team, made a U.S. team, and then went over and competed, I think my first – international tournament was in Croatia and, you know, freaking just loved, meddled there and, you know, loved freaking when they pulled that American flag up and like you got to hear your anthem, it was just like, okay, this is freaking, this is awesome. And so how long did that career run for? That career ran until the archery, world archery decided to do a world cup and they decided to make the World Cup. Um, so at the World Cup, I think only two at the year. At the time, it was maybe two or three archers. You had to be on the, on a team um, would shoot in the World Cups. But whoever the finalists, the top four were at the end of the World Cup, then you had to go to the World Cup finals, which was like a big thing. And they decided to add one tournament and move the world cup finals it was like september 15th this year and so i remember um world archery telling me you know hey if you're going to shoot on the world cup team you have to give us the commitment that you will not only do all four world cups but if you make the world cup final that you will also participate in the world cup final otherwise we're going to find someone that will, you know, because we don't want to like end up making a final and then someone don't can't get off work or whatever. And so I, you know, it was in September. I just said, I am not competing in archery in September. It's and for done. everyone that doesn't know, September is freaking prime. That's hunting season. <laughs> yeah. That's when you, you're only thinking about, you're thinking about one thing and one thing only. <laughs> yes. Just freaking hunting. That's it. <laughs> that's it. And so you, kind of walked yeah i walked Mm -hmm. now i walked from i walked from there and then you know i ended up business wise uh started consulting went out on my own started consulting you know started a family sharon and i you know it was like i wanted to be home more a lot more people could come to me you know for coaching and stuff Uh, and i was 
I was coaching around the world at that time. Uh, but yeah, just, you know, life changes. You become 30, you know, close to 30. It's just, you know, I didn't, I just didn't see the future that I wanted just being a target archer my whole life. You know, and I think, you know, we talked about this. I think some fighters are in that same position of like, yeah, you love it. And, you know, you can go win like fight of the night and you could make a pretty good paycheck for that time. But the reality is like your one or two fights a year that you're going to make a paycheck at, they're going to make 98% of the rest of your life not as, you know, not what you could make mm-hmm. for it if you had a different focus. So, you know, I just I just focused on something else. Now, uh, from a business perspective, did you have the vision of, like, knock on archery? Because essentially what you do is freaking give away an incredible amount of knowledge and information and instruction. That's what you do. That Did you know from the beginning, hey, listen, if I just give this stuff away, then – People will, you know, want want to buy some of the stuff that I recommend, utilize some of the equipment that I make. Is that did you have that vision, or did it just start to happen? Uh, it's hard to say if I was in a different position then, if I would have felt that way, because I don't feel like I'm greedy. I feel like the better I do for myself in other avenues of life, the more I can give back to my sport, and I want to because you know I feel like. Hey, I'm doing fine. I, you know, and I want to help other people be better. But the truth of the matter is, you know, when you're in your 20s making 30 grand a year or 50 grand a year at your job and you're trying to go to tournaments to win an extra 10 on the weekend and you're just putting a lot of time in and you're shooting 20 to 30,000 arrows, you know, a year and living out, you know, sharing rooms with people and stuff like that, like there's a lot of stepping stones that have to, there's a lot of sacrifices you make before it gets to the point where it's like, you know, you could offer all that for free. But once, once the community and I, and by that, I mean, you know, I refer to them as the knock on nation. Once, once we had a pedestal to where we were able to, to deliver out information and the, our community came in and started supporting that initiative, then it allows me, you know, the more people support like either things that we offer at the store or let's say I do a training series um, and there's a training series that helps someone do better, but maybe there's a product that we have as our business, you know, that'll be in there. And I know not everyone's gonna buy it, but if someone, does, you know, if they really like that series and it was worth, you know, a hundred bucks to them, I would rather, instead of them paying a subscription to like support us with, you know, a product that we have that Mm -hmm. I, that I personally believe in for that particular thing. Now everyone has their, has their preference, but I don't think I could have done it that way to begin with, even though when I was kind of hustling and doing what I could to like, you know, build, I would always go and do youth camps or go do Christian camps and do stuff like that for free. Like I always did that. Mm -hmm. I always worked with, you know, the kids after the tournament or, um, you know, it, it kind of got to the point where I told sponsors, when, especially when I went out and I was kind of consulting, I told sponsors, I would like to travel through Europe and go to every archery club and do a seminar, but, you know, I can't pay for it myself. Would you, you know, would you like to be the one that sponsors the event in Dusseldorf? You know, and if so, send me 25 of your hats and some keychains or whatever, and that's what we'll put on everyone's seat that, you know, that comes. Mm-hmm. And so we just do these tours where I'd have magazine editors drive me all around Europe, and every day was a different stop. You know, it was just kind of like a band. Every day was a different archery club. Stop, teach archery, and then, you know, do it. But in the end, I made something more because, you know, the sponsors were paying something and 
you know, getting some exposure from it. And then I also did a lot of writing. You know, I did a lot of a lot of written coaching first because like getting your foot in the door when you don't technically have like a name for yourself yet is a little bit of a struggle, but I saw a lot of magazines needing fresh content. And so, you know, I just started writing. So from like 2000, I would say from 2005 to probably 2012 or 14, I was, I wrote for like seven different languages. I'd probably do about 250 pages a year just in articles. And Honestly, my thing was I'd send these articles out. I didn't really make hardly anything off any of the articles. I just always made sure that they used my photo content so that, you know, I was able to give exposure to the brands that I represented. And so, you know, it was just it's kind of like the perfect storm of having enough support to where I could grow into where I wanted to be and then, you know, then eventually like knock on Knock On's like evolved. Originally, it was a TV show. It was just a hunting show, but it was a hunting show that I was very focused on having educational portions. I didn't like B-roll in hunting shows. You know, I didn't. I always thought there needs to be more education and how to and why was this hunt successful or here's the equipment that I'm taking on this hunt. You know, I changed arrows or changed broadheads. Here's the why. You know, here's different mistakes you can make as a bow hunter for shooting technique. So that was, that kind of gave us the platform to, to create a name for ourselves. And then obviously, you know, we've just continually built we meaning I've only ever done the content. The brand was always sharing, you know, the brand and, you know, knock on archery.com has always been sharing. Um, whereas, you know, I really don't like that side of things. I just really want to like, I want to teach people from my experience of of whatever's happening at the moment. How'd the TV show come about? The TV show came because um, one of the companies that I worked for uh, was an archery company. And so each year they would pick a, a certain demographic and tell me to focus my initiatives there to grow the brand in that demographic. So one time it was, you know, South Africa, another time it was like Germany, another time it was Australia, but it came around to Canada. And so I went up and talked to a lot of shops up there and said, you know, hey, what do you guys think about doing like a seminar tour, mm -hmm. like what was working for me in other demographics? Because over there, people were jumping on that because no one would travel over there to do that. Maybe it's like that with jujitsu. If a, if a reputable coach travels to somewhere where they're never going to see that person, they, it'll sell out, you know, for sure. Versus in Canada, they said at the time, um, Canada just got their first outdoor TV network, which was called wild TV. And they had hunting shows, but most of their shows were shows that we had watched here five, 10 years ago. And it was just, all the shows domestically were sending all their repeats up there and just like, you know, just kind of rebranding. But then also like selling that airtime to their sponsors here, like, yeah, we're also airing, you know, 10 times a week in Canada for this or that. So when I was up there, the shop said, well, I mean, we would love to get like super technical seminars, but what brings people in the door is when the hunting shows come. Like if, if you're on a hunting show, there if you're on wild TV, we'll freaking pack the store. So I remember going back to my boss at the time who actually works for us now. And I told him, I said, well, they really said to get the foot in the door, like we need to be, a, I need to be a show. And I had already done DVDs that were like, you know, kind of, out of the, the trunk of your car DVDs that I thought were a little bit of ahead of their time because I always said that like I wanted our hunting show to be like hunting kind of crashed with MTV Cribs crashed with like Robin Big. <laughs> and so like our first DVDs, 
that's what they were. <laughs> and so they were to like way faster paced music and like way different editing than kind of like the banjo music do you put stuff. Those on, do you put those on YouTube? I haven't. I need to get you one of those DVDs. How come you don't put them on YouTube? On your YouTube channel? I People mean, are going to be amped to watch them now. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. They, I mean, looking back, it'd be like you watching yourself on video 10 years ago. You'd be like, man, was I horrible. Well, you at least got to have some fun with it and put them on Oh, there. yeah. I mean, like that haircut you posted the other day. <laughs> Prince Valiant coming at you. <laughs> Dude, that was freaking awesome. Bro, it was 1977. <laughs> that was what was happening. And I didn't, I don't think I even had, I don't think, I don't even think I thought. You know what I'm saying? I didn't think I thought about like a haircut. I think it was just, you know, my mom would come in with a pair of scissors, you know, done. Like I wasn't like, do I need to get Hold a haircut? Still do I not? for a minute. Yeah. Do I need to get a haircut? Do I not need to get? She's just like, that's, it was like, that's what's happening, right? You don't have any choice in the matter and didn't care about it one way or the other. I still barely care. I feel like when we post <laughs> this podcast, we need to put a thing in there that says like, Unless you're a dork about archery, fast forward to like <laughs> the hair moment. <laughs> because like me talking about my past to me seems like, I don't know, I'd way rather. What I remember about you the most is like how hard we laugh at stuff. <laughs> and, you know, it's such a different side than, you know, kind of like at the beginning of the thing when you're reading you're so serious and awesome at that. Like you're the you're the perfect person to like do voiceover work. But I also know like at any given second, if it was just the two of us, you could drop a one liner in there that would freaking bust people up in here. Yeah, I definitely. I mean, that's bro. Yeah, you're right. Any of this stuff, it's like you having fun while you're doing it. If it's not fun to do, then why are you doing it? Yeah. I will say though, like I like to have fun, you like to have fun, but man, it's legit. When you go into like kill mode on a hunt, it's freaking, I, I'm like, oh yeah, here it is. You, cause you go into just like, boom. Like I, I just see, I'm like, okay, I gotta hang on. Cause he's freaking, he's going. And it's, it's legit, man. Well, I think that same thing that's just inside, it's dormant for, and I'm pretty, I'm pretty like low key and docile most of the time. Um, I feel like that's how I am naturally, but then cer like certain things like that, when that moment triggers and it's like a game face, that's kind of what happened when I recognized like I wasn't good at archery. Mm -hmm. You know, I realized like, you know, I just, it's like hyper-focused. Mm -hmm. um, and it gets that way with my training too. If I know I'm not up to par, I get very hyper-focused on, on just getting better mm -hmm. and, and training, and I can kind of just go over the deep end. You know, I can either be all in or, or totally out, which is kind of like from a target archery point of view, people ask me why I don't compete. I don't have – like I don't have a drive to compete. That's not to say if for some reason I, you know, did it accidentally and I wouldn't get fired up again like oh, no, Tyson I, I've did seen or something. You do that. I've seen you do that where we're walking down the tack and all of a sudden someone's like, hey, dud, I bet I can do this. I bet I can hit that. You're like, same thing. I'll see your face and I'm like, oh, he's about to just <laughs> 12 ring this thing, you know, because you get in that competitive mode that happens. You know what I, I wanted to come back to? And, and hey, the reason why I think this stuff is interesting, look, I don't think you have to be interested in archery because you, you your, your path in life was not normal, right? Mm -hmm. And people, look, you could have been talking about someone that was into spearfishing or someone that was into jujitsu or someone that was into anything. To, to go down the path like you did and forge your own way ahead and make a life for yourself based on doing something that you loved People could apply that in any category, yeah. whether you're into knitting or whether you're into freaking uh, bowling, it doesn't matter. So yeah. there's some real application. And I guess I should have said that at the beginning. Hey, if you're thinking about the way your life looks, especially if you're 20 years old or 25 years old and you're kind of like, well, I'm doing this, but I don't like it. I mean, here you are, you're like going to college, but I don't really want to do that, you know? Yeah. Hey, and, and you've done that multiple times. 3D archery, I'm totally into it. Oh, guess what? I'm not really into it that, that much into it anymore. Okay, I'm going to do something else. Go to target archery. Okay, I'm really into that for a while. Uh, guess what? It's interfering with my hunting. Not going to do that anymore. Now I'm going to focus on hunting. I'm going to focus on building this brand. I'm going to focus on creating new products. So all that stuff, it may seem mundane to you looking back at it, but 
for a normal person that can take this and apply it to, you know, uh, uh, building something, creating something, it's like you've done well, not just from an archery perspective, but a business perspective in, in at the same time. So yeah. it's real lessons. One of the lessons I wanted to come back to, because we kind of drifted over it, but when you were talking about as somewhere along the, the way, you realize that you like freaking rage doesn't help, right? <laughs> rage doesn't help. And you yeah. said you had a coach that was like, hey, listen, the arrows that you shot, and this is such an important, This is, again, this is a life lesson, and, and there's all kinds of things that tie into life and archery, but the life lesson is like, hey, you shot that arrow and you freaking shanked it, right? Yeah. You can blow your next eight arrows. Like you can yeah. just f send them all out the freaking, you know, into a tree somewhere. Or you can just be like, okay, that didn't, doesn't matter. Can't change it. Move forward. What was that lesson like? Who taught it to you? Um, an Olympic arch, an Olympic archery coach who I'm pretty sure was also a Marine. I mean, like, you know, straight up Marine haircut all the time. But he coached a couple, uh, a couple like super high level ath uh, archers. But he was also like, he didn't coach very many people, and he was also you know very. I don't know. He was he was very like stone, you know. So you knew if he was there, he was there watching his few athletes, um, and they like would pay for him to come and stuff like that. But I remember one time. I was in a leading group. You got peer grouped, and then the second day, you're you know like ranks one, two, three, and four together on a target, you mm -hmm. know, and they shoot through. And then it kind of came down to the last target, and you know I needed a twelve or something to make it into the shoot off, you know, into the top six, and uh, and I missed, you know, and I was freaking pissed about it you know like broke my stabilizer over my knee and freaking hammer tossed my bow through the woods type thing <laughs> and you know ended up coming back like with my bow just kind of seeing the damage I did and um and he came over to me his name was Tim Strickland and he said you know you could be an amazing archer but he said until you start not letting the arrow that you shoot affect the ones that are still in your quiver, you never will. And he said, he goes, do you know a way to get an arrow back once it's left your bow? And I said, what do you mean? He goes, do you know a way to get it back other than to physically go down there and pull it out of the target like you just did? And I said, no, sir. And he said, well, once it's gone, it's gone. And he said, so if you make one mistake, don't make the same mistake for every arrow that's left in your quiver, you know, make one, pull it, you know, pull that arrow out, throw it away, whatever you want. But there's other arrows in the quiver that are capable of doing what you want them to do. Mm -hmm. And so there's been tournaments where I've, you know, I've actually talked, you know, where I will freaking make a bad shot and then just look down at my quiver and be like, do any of you sons of bitches want to go in the 10 ring? Because <laughs> that guy didn't. And, you know, and, and it was just like a totally different approach. And mentally, it's, you know, I've, I've totally, it, it honestly helped me. This was a, it's kind of a weird thing to say, but, um, you know, he told me, he said, you won't figure out how to win until you learn how to lose. Mm -hmm. And that was, a, you know, I was like the rage of losing was overpowering my ability to perform at my best because I was letting, you know, I was letting those things happen. And then I remember kind of wanting to get into that a little more. And I read some kind of a sports psychology book. You know, I don't know what it was called, but it said something in there that, this sports psychologist had talked to like, he worked with a lot of high level pitchers and he told them that part of their success was that they had to be able to accept that there was gonna be an umpire that would, they needed to expect two to three bad calls by the umpire every game. And when they got a call that they didn't think was right, they could just check it off the list of, okay, well, there was one of mm -hmm. them. And so I started doing that too and started saying, okay, when I go to an international event, because there certainly are judges that 
call them really, really tight, you know, and they're all looking at them with a magnifying glass, but there's some, like when you'll say like judge and then, you know, some dude comes over that ha- is notorious. Like if the, you know, when they do their random thing of like judge so-and-so go pull it. And then you see him, you're like, it's out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cause some of them, you just think like, they think like if, if they can't figure it out themselves, I'm just going to go over there and look around at it, but I'm calling it out, you know, and then there'd be some like, oh, yeah, I got a chance with this gal, like, you know, <laughs> hey, Susie, how you doing today? <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, learning that, you know, learning learning how to lose, because I've lost way more than I've won, and that, you know, and that that's a, that's a fact of – you know, I, I you have to figure out a way to win in life. You know, you do have to figure out a way to win. But if you deal with like being hyper competitive, then you also have to learn how to lose. Otherwise, you freaking derail yourself way more than others can derail you. And I'm convinced that I beat myself way more than other people beat me in, in most of the things that I've lost at. You know, it's like, which is why now my coaching's evolved so much because now my coaching is so focused on, you know, what you execute within your box because I kind of got to the point where I recognized if I make a good shot, it's a 10. That's the highest score on the paper. So if I do that all day, no one's going to beat me we're tied at the end. And if I just keep doing that until tomorrow, then guess what? Worst case scenario, me and that other guy are still tied. But if I shoot nines, then yeah, the other guy is already at an advantage. So, you know, if I focus on just execution and so once I kind of came to that realization of no one can beat me if I'm executing, if I make a good shot right here, I don't need to see where it lands because if my sight tape's right and I trust the equipment that I've got, I know it's in the middle. Like I know that, but I have to execute here. And so it really got to the point where I like, I took away my spotting scope to where I wasn't getting in the habit of shooting an arrow looking for the result, (laughs) shooting an arrow looking at a result, which is something that even today when I work with parents, I tell them that there's, there's like, parents that at an archery tournament they sit like front row with a spotting scope so the kid will shoot and then they'll be like 10 at 11 o'clock and then you know and the kid will shoot and just turn around to like dad to get confirmation of like how that was Mm -hmm. and so part of the things when you have that type of parent is telling them like listen this kid like they need to execute them looking for you at you for you know the result all the time it it you athletes start to lean on their coach so much and that was actually one of the problems with um some of the people that had that coach that i talked about they only did really well when he could be there with them because you know he'd be like all right hey you missed that one f those guys you know you're good you're the freak you know and they had to have that Mm -hmm that that continual like affirmation whereas honestly from my life i feel like most of it i was alone you know in regards to like i like training alone you know honestly i like archery too because it's a singular sport so if i train and if i prep then I'm ready and it's in my hands. Same with hunting, you know, same way with hunting. If I, you know, I've had hunts where I've had a lot of distractions and I threw my stuff in a case that, you know, the day before and went and, you know, missed a couple shots and was just like enraged. But then I also thought like, yeah, dude, you didn't prep. You did no homework. You know, that's what happens. So I feel like because I've had to train that way and even even when I lift, you know, I love lifting by myself versus like going to somewhere where people distract me. I just feel like, you know, I've I know that if I put in the work, then at that point it's it's really on me, not on someone else and like when I told you we sucked at football, you know, there was a couple people like 
you know, like Jason, who knew their role and knew their position and other people's position, and they would cover for people that maybe didn't do something right. But there's also three quarters of the team that didn't. So in high school, what's hard is I don't feel like anyone really prepped as hard as me in that because I honestly like put no effort anywhere else, you know, whereas they probably had lives and maybe, you know, actually got good grades and stuff. Um, (laughs) But I think that's why archery has been so awesome to me is because, you know, the harder I've pushed, the harder I've pushed at it and the more I've put into it, like, it's not like weightlifting where you plateau. I haven't found a plateau yet. Like I can make a target further and I can suck again or, you know, you know, there's just, or I can try a different species or a different, you know, climate or a different time of year. And it's a whole new challenge. Like it's a clean slate. And then you're, you know, trying to formulate a plan and map out a plan of how do I, you know, how do I like win this challenge? I, I, I was at a, you and I were at TAC the first time we did TAC and like I was like feeling pretty good and I'm like you know you're like bro you're freaking this is awesome you're doing great and we're getting through the course a little bit and then man <laughs> then I just I, I like hit a branch right and it was a little situation where you said step back and you meant back behind me but I thought you meant back away from the target and so I like didn't, it didn't even make sense to me what you said, so I didn't listen to you, which is a mistake. So I just cracked off this around, and this thing just freaking just bang into yeah. a tree. And, and everyone yeah. and, on that mountain. Like, everyone. The, like, the, the, it sounded like you hit <laughs> someone's like door with a, mac, like, with a microphone on the back whack. side of it. Just down. And, and this is what I was, so I was earlier, you know, you were saying like, hey, you know, when somebody grabs me by the face mask and is like, hey, you need to get this shit together right yeah. now. Like, that's what you want. And then, but like, I've, I've done that. Like when I was in the, when I was in the SEAL teams and I was teaching, like I would be, you know, I'd have some guy that I'd be like, hey man, if I freak out on this guy, he's going to freak out <laughs> and he's going to collapse and break down mentally. And I got someone else where it was like, if I don't get their attention, you know, some guy might pull aside and say, hey, listen, man, think about what's going on. Another guy may be like, hey, well, you need to think about what's going on. And you got to figure out what methodology you're going to use. Yeah. So what's fun, what's interesting for me is when you're coaching me, like I know what you're doing. I know that I go, oh, he, he's trying to get me to chill out. Because like, like on that one, you were like, you're like, hey, man, hit you hit that limb up there. You know, it's just trying to say. But, you know, you, you said, you know, knock another one. Knock, take a step back, knock another one. I was like, cool. And I was like, he's just trying to get me to chill out so I don't freak out because I just freaking T-boned a tree. And and like, I know what you're doing, but as Echo Charles says sometimes to me, he knows what I'm doing when I'm talking to him about stuff. Yeah. He's like, I know what you're doing. Guess what? It still works. Yeah. It still works to be like, hey, here's what's going on, man. Just, just back off a little bit. Or, dude, you're freaking out. You're not, you know how to do this. Like those kind of coach and also being like, Hey, get over here. Like, Hey, you need to move down. Like those kind of things are important. So for you as a coach, the way you read and I've watched now I've watched you coach a bunch, but like at TAC, you'll sit there, like we'll sit there at a place at one of the targets and you'll just like watch four or five groups shoot. And so I just sit there and watch you coach them, you know, and I'll listen to what you're saying. And you, I can tell that you're going, you're reading people, you know, and going, Oh, this person needs confidence or this person needs to think through, needs to slow things down or this person's getting freaking all all target fixated at the last yeah. second and they're cracking the round off. So you're reading them and then you're applying the right coaching technique to what's going on in their head and that's freaking, that's just like, that's why, uh, honestly to me, your whole life, the number one thing for me when I look at you is like coach. Like that's the the highest thing that I look at you. I was like, man, that guy's a, f-. look, he's a good archer. He's a good hunter. He's a badass athlete. But man, he's a freaking dialed in coach. It's what I'm passionate about. Like especially, you know, with honestly, Rogan introducing me to Andy, like I think was really the thing that started everything down the path of now how many military guys mm-hmm. that I've been able to get into and gals get into archery. Um, and, you know, I love that because there's so many things that are there and especially with T 
team guys, you know, whether it's, you know, whether it's, you know, army or, you know, it, it, it really doesn't matter. But if, if, if they've been some t- type of a team or like special forces, they just, you know, they're good students and they're hypercritical of themselves. Now, granted, some of them are like, I got this. And yeah, once they realize, no, I just made an ass of myself, they'll, they'll listen. But even if they don't listen right there, by the next time they talk to you, they've a hundred percent, you know, went crazy about trying to apply that, you know, ever the, the work ethic is very, it's like the perfect formula for a coach, mm-hmm. you know, is, is all those guys and ever, every one of them that I've introduced it to so far has needed, has really needed archery as, I don't know, like, like you said, it's like a quiet, it's like a quiet form of what you used to do, mm-hmm. you know? Well, what it is really, to me, it's a new mission. Like you, you spend your whole life with a mission, with like something that you know that you're focused on. And then one day you wake up, like you retire or you get out, the mission's gone. Like you can't have it anymore. And look, you can try and hang on onto it and you can try and freaking relive those things in your head, but that's not gonna be, that's not gonna work out. Yeah. Cause it's not there anymore. And that's a, sh- that's a shitty reality to face. Like when I had to clean, when my, when I retired and then I went and cleaned out my cage and I spent most of my career within like a 300 yard radius, like seal team one, seal team three, seal team seven. I was at seal team two in Virginia beach for, for a little while, but most of it, you could throw a football to everywhere I was. Mm-hmm. So when I was 19 years old, I was walking up the steps of seal team one fast forward 20, 24 years and I'm 200 yards away, not even, I'm 100 yards away, cleaning out my gear locker for the last time. Yeah. And it's gone. And all that, my whole life, what everything I cared about, the only thing I ever knew is gone. And l- look, I look back at it, if I can help out in any way and I go talk to the teams, that's cool, but that's not my mission anymore. And so this happens to guys. And, and they get out and they don't have a mission anymore. So all of a sudden you go, hey man, here's a freaking bow and arrow. It's a primitive tool that you use to hunt shit. And you can get good at it. And, and the, the, the fundamentals are similar. You know, the fundamentals are similar. And like when you taught me for the first time, Andy was sitting there translating. He's like, hey, what he means is front sight focus. Hey, what he means is easy, easy you know, uh, just squeeze the trigger. He was translating me for me military stuff, and I was like, "Oh, got it, got it, got it." Yeah. And you know, Andy. I mean, Andy's a good example of him just being like, "Oh, cool, I got a new mission now. Here's yeah. what I can do." Mm-hmm. And and look, Andy. Of course, Andy has a ton of other things going on in his life, and he's got freaking parachuting and uh, jujitsu. Now yeah. he's totally obsessed with jujitsu, which yep. is freaking awesome. So so people find new mission, but this is a good one. It's a good one because there's so many similarities. Gear prep. Right when you're in the SEAL teams, you're freaking obsessed with gear prep. You're figuring out well the best way to carry things, the best way to do things, and you're like, okay, I want to be ready for this. I want to be ready for this operation. Right? I got to be in f- good physical shape. I got to be able to like clear my mind when shit's going sideways and be like, all right, what's happening right now? So all those things are are so similar, and I and I know that you spend. I guess was Andy the first like vet that you worked with? Probably that. I mean. Probably not, I guess, but yeah, it was the first one where I was where I was mentally really ready for that. I think I was on a different like pole position, like I was at a different stage, and it it, it honestly it meant more, you know. I was gonna say with Andy, like Andy, what may have been different is that Andy was like, what is that saying about like when the, when the when the student is ready, the master will appear. Yeah. Like I I don't know if you could have found someone that was more ready. Yeah. to like pick up this stuff and start going, yep. you know? And so that's probably why it left an impression on you. It damn sure left an impression on Andy because this this dude's totally <laughs> obsessed, you know? <laughs> so, and, and it's awesome. And you know what's funny about it? Well, Andy's freaking hilarious. You want to like, yeah. when you talk about like, oh, Jocko, you make some good one-liners hanging out. Like I can listen to Andy just all day long. And, and what's really funny to Andy to me is like how he, 
the way he handles uh, uh, like mistakes is he just hammers himself. <laughs> He's so freaking hilarious. He leaves no room for someone <laughs> yeah. to make fun of him because yeah. if if There's you don't fi- if you don't fire off within three seconds, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's freaking classic, classic. Yeah, and that's the kind of thing is when you know when when you go out, it gives you a mission. Now you got your friends with you. You know, now yeah. you're like, okay, cool. Now we're, and we're doing things like what you do in the SEAL teams. Guess what? If if Andy and I are on a pistol range and we're shooting together, like he's going to be making fun of me, right? <laughs> I'm going I'm to shank some round off or whatever, need a mag change in the middle what I didn't need. Or I'm going to do something stupid. Yeah. And he's going to, it's going to, it's going to be fun. And you know what? It's going to make me better. Yeah. It's going to make me better. And that's another thing I noticed at TAC, like the amount of vets that were up there. Yeah. It's freaking awesome. It's awesome. And guys coming up to me and telling me like, bro, you know, I started this. I started this. This is what I'm doing. And these are guys that freaking, you know, two years ago, whatever, when they got out of the Marine Corps after six years or after eight years or after 18 years, they didn't have a mission anymore. Mm Mm-hmm. And now all of a sudden they're freaking jocked up. They got their gear on. They showed me their freaking range finder and they're pumped, man. They're pumped. Yep. And so the fact that you've sort of opened up this uh, opportunity for so many guys to start going down the path, it's, man, it's so beneficial to dudes. Yeah, it's freaking awesome. And it's, there also comes a point in time where you want to, like, I'm fortunate that I can pick and choose what I'm doing right now. And so I really want to pick and choose things that's rewarding to me. And hopefully that's not, you know, selfish, but there's also like, I don't know, there's, there's people that I work with where I know this person could live on this planet a lot longer because they have a new focus right now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and archery's changed their life totally. And what's cool about it is you don't have to be, in like perfect physical shape too. So, I mean, there's times where people get into archery and they're kind of a little bit lost, you know, maybe, you know, maybe they're not as in shape as they were or whatever, but that's, what's cool about it is it's not age specific and it's, you know, if you can pull it back, you can do it. And I think the natural progression is you pull it back and, you know, maybe you're not good and then you get a little better and then you know there's a ton of people now that are just for a better food source alternative they're open-minded to hunting if it's you know in their minds fair chase which you know bow hunting you know kind of lowers that boundary for people to where they're like okay if i'm going to put in all this work and do it i'm totally cool you know eating this thing or killing it or whatever but then once you take that step, you realize, oh, this is a whole different kind of hard because now you're dealing with, in my opinion, some of the animals are just so much smarter than other things you could roll up on a Merc, mm-hmm. right? I mean, they're they're freaking keyed up, you know. Because I remember uh, Andy and I were on something where it was it was it was a pretty tough like. Yeah, it was kind of a little bit of a miracle that we pulled off this stock and jack something. I don't know what it was, but um, I I remember saying like, you know, it doesn't seem like it'd be that hard to kill a person. And he's just like, dude, because it is n- not this hard at all. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, he goes, all of us would be. He's like, you know. He's like, a lot of us would be, you know, at a totally different level if we had to learn this way first. He's like, it. he goes, if if everyone had this background prior to going into the teams, he's like, it would be, <laughs> it would be insane. No, it'd be very beneficial, very beneficial. There's so many things that you got to think about that are the exact same. You know, the, well, with elk, the only thing that's not the same with elk is smell. Like, like and although if you talk to some of the Vietnam guys, they're like, oh, the VC yeah, or the, mm-hmm. the NVA would smell you. Yep. And so if you. And they could smell and them. And they could smell them too. Yep. So maybe we need to just account for everything. Well, now with dogs, like what I told Andy was I said, listen, you know, if, if I knew there was someone coming to jack me, you know, I would definitely have 
at least a dog. You know, I mm-hmm. definitely have dogs around because obviously dogs could smell too. You know, if you train them on something, you know, specific type of, type of gear or something like that, it would be an advantage. But I've actually talked to, um, well, one of the guys that we're with tonight, um, he's actually hooking me up with some of the guys that are going to do some of the training down in Lanai mm-hmm. for the sniper training. Mm-hmm. Um, they're doing a couple team things there. And so he had asked me if I wanted to go down just to to teach some navigation of like, t- instead of learning the long distance aspect to like make some competitions on the closest shot mm-hmm. to where they, you know, to where I would assess their choice of that navigation and like what they could do different to where it's like, okay, we know how you, how far you can shoot something from now, you know, who can jack something at a yard or whatever, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's, um, it's totally different to have to get within, you know, 50 yards or something. That's just freaking crazy. Yeah. It's, it's crazy <laughs> to think that way. Whereas with a rifle, you know, you can be, I mean, at least 500 yards you can be 500 yards and be like you know we're good i got this i I was so we went surfing yesterday at least yeah we went surfing yesterday and uh i was telling pause was i that bad was i that bad (laughs) well actually no i paused for a second to think to myself did he surf or not and the fact of the matter is you did surf you did surf. You paddled on the waves. You caught the waves, and you stood up. That's why I paused. I was like, "Wait, did he surf?" Yes, you did. You caught multiple waves. You paddled into them yourself, and then you stood up and rode the waves. That's what surfing is. So you did. We did surf yesterday, and I know you'd only been one other time, which was the last time you went was was a little bit more at of the a, pier. Yeah, it's at the pier, and it's a it's a much more forgivable sort of like easier step. Like we, where we went yesterday, that's uh, like you can't push yourself into those waves. You can't touch the bottom and be like, oh, I got this. You have to actually surf. Oh, yeah. Where we surfed yesterday, you actually have to surf. But when we were when we were going out, we were with Josh, <laughs> and I was sort of like, you know, I'm just gonna let Josh because like I I don't want to I didn't want to be telling you things and Josh telling you things and you're sitting there freaking got two people telling you shit to do and it just too much, right? Yeah. So I was just kind of do I was just kind of going. And, but man, as I was going down, there was like, just before we even got in the water, there was 97 things I wanted to tell you. Like, <laughs> hey man, you gotta watch out for this, this thing over here, this path over here, you gotta watch, here's the lineup, here's where the here's where the, uh, the channels are, like this is where you wanna sit, here's what you wanna watch. I, like I had 97, th- before we even got in the water, just before we got in the water. And I'm not, you know, if you're at a, at a freaking black belt level in, archery like i'm not that i'm not at that highest level of surfing and i was like man imagine how many things were going through your head as you're watching me like a freaking monkey with a damn bow (laughs) just thinking all right with a 50 foot (laughs) surfboard (laughs) yeah yeah i mean it was just like the amount of things that 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 you don't know about surfing, the amount of things that I don't know about archery and about hunting and about scent and about terrain and about the way the freaking animals react to this and different animals react a different way and there's like so much to learn. It's freaking crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. It's hard as a coach because a lot of times you forget more than you, like you don't know what you should be talking about until you realize like, oh, oh yeah. And uh, you gave me like, there were several of those yesterday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the like, worst one was what you told me when we were on the deck, like watching, <laughs> we were like watching. You're like, yeah, I meant to tell you when you were like, you see how all the waves are coming in right there, like <laughs> off that set. <laughs> like that's why Josh and I, when we were done, we would go around those yeah. to like loop back. And he's like, you know, you just kept going straight back up the gut. Yeah. And he's like, I was just waiting for that board to like freaking T-Rex your face. <laughs> <laughs> and meanwhile, I'm like, bro, that would have been something like when we were standing Bef- up on the top, looking down, if you would have said like, hey, you see how all those waves break like this? So when you get your set and you ride that out, you know, looping behind that. So you're not yeah. like freaking, I was full blown, like doing buds training. Oh, freaking with just this. taking them on the freaking head for freaking like eight minutes. What happened to Dudley? Oh, he's in, he's in the impact zone just getting hammered. But 
but you did get up like while we were surfing, you know, you did surf. And, and to me, that's a testament to, you know, like being athletic and be, being able to actually, you're really your first day out to go paddle into waves and stand up. That's not easy to do. Now, Josh Hall did make you a freaking, basically an aircraft carrier <laughs> for a surfboard. <laughs> It's freaking massive. Yeah, eleven six, <laughs> and it's like over four inches thick and twenty four inches. Which anyone that's a surfer is hearing these numbers going, "Damn, that is an actual aircraft." <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's uh, what a perfect platform. And plus, you're how much do you weigh? Two forty. Oh yeah, like that's a different level. You need a big ass board, <laughs> and it looks like Echo Charles. Yes, sir. What's up with your surfing career? Uh, minimal at best. We'll How come? I don't know. There's no tangible reason. I mean, I guess if I search my soul, I, you know, I did bodyboarding, sponging, mm-hmm. as it were. Sponging. You know, for the most of my adolescent life. And then, yeah. How did you that, not, how did you not, like, say, oh, wouldn't it be cool to stand up on this thing and ride this wave and glide yeah. through the ocean? <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know. It's just one of those things. You know how, like, where I grew up on the south side of Kauai, they're actually, no, they're surfing. But they, I grew up at the beach, like, literally mm-hmm. grew up at the beach. Mm-hmm. And then. Uh, again, you're saying this like this is some sort of a weird way that you wouldn't would, be yeah, surfing. But you're like, no, no, no. I grew up at the beach. No, no, yeah, no. exactly. But, uh, right. But <laughs> if you understand. What's wrong with you? If you understand the progression. <laughs> Just naturally kind of growing up there, you go, you're swimming, you mm-hmm. know, in the baby pond at Playful Beach. And then you're like, okay, then you're kind of body surfing a little bit. Then yep. you're boogie boarding, yep. body boarding, yep. sponging, yes. you know, all same yes. thing. And, and then, then, yes, exactly. Right. Then you start to go surf. And, and there's a, there's a, how should I say, a geographical element to mm-hmm. it as well. You're literally in the baby pond, then you're outside the baby pond, and then the surfing waves and the surfing spots, those are out. So you always see the surfers, but they're way out. Mm-hmm. So I get maybe I think when we started getting into football and stuff, it's like the beach started to be less and less, and then it, we just never. I don't know. I never did. Are you thinking if maybe I could now step is the in time for a second? Yeah, step. So like you're gonna have to get out, like you said, it, where you want to be is a little bit further out. Yeah. You know, that's where the good stuff is. It's best to crush an arm workout like 45 minutes before <laughs> your first day. Yeah. yeah. Well, that was interesting too. So, like, we get in the water. Well, I have been surfing before, though. Right. I never, right. Yeah, I never. No, but I'm, I was li- like, I'm talking to Dud and I'm like, bro, I've been on hunts with him. Like, I'm watching him move through the forest and he's just like, you know, freaking Gliding 14 foot through. legs and he's just stepping over, <laughs> like, he's stepping over small, stepping like, over yeah, like small yeah. trees and yeah. stuff like this. And I'm, I'm like, dude, you know, and then watching him shoot, I watch him shoot a ton and then like huck a football or whatever. I'm like, yeah, this guy's a great athlete. And so I'm thinking, we're going surfing. And I'm like, okay, you know, he, and I said, man, you're going to, I was, I told you this. I go, bro, with your long arms, you're going to just be like, and this big board, you're going to be, Paddles. you're going to be like a freaking, you know, a, a cigarette boat just going <laughs> through the water. So we go in, and I, like I said, I wasn't doing any coaching. I was just kind of leaving that to Josh, and I get in the water and I start paddling out. And then I look back because Dud was going next, and then Josh was doing sort of like cleanup, right? In case something went sideways in there while we were getting in. <laughs> So then I see Dud, like, okay, he's good, he's in, and then I start paddling, and I'm not, like, racing, but I'm just paddling out, and then Josh comes up next to me, and I'm like, oh, that's weird, I wonder where Dud is, so I'm paddling a little bit more, and I look back, and <laughs> so now it's been, like, probably one minute and 30 seconds, maybe, I look back, and as soon as I look back, I see Dud, and he looks like he's just, like, <laughs> freaking gotten to a wrestling match with a bear, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, oh, yeah, because here's the thing, and you brought this up to me a long time ago, uh, Echo Charles, if you're not used to it, that's, like, it. if you're not used to it, it doesn't matter. I, look, it matters, and if you weren't in good shape at all, then... It would have really sucked. Yeah. But if you're not used to that little particular muscle group and the technique, because you're in the water and there's balance going yeah. on, and yeah, it t- it's a little bit, <laughs> it's a little yeah, bit there, trickier. I mean, I was laughing at myself because, uh, well, first off, I didn't know like where we were going 
because we were we were surf you know, going to be surfing sets right that were further out mm-hmm. you know I don't know where it was probably won't say because I know you have your spots but so my first experience was we walked out from the pier and like where stuff was breaking right there that's where I was surfing so when he, he kind of jumped off the rock and went out there a ways and I was talking to Josh and Josh was like yeah just get where you're comfortable and launch out on your board you know wait you know wait for a smooth spot and jump out so when I did that by that point Jocko was like 100 yards out so I thought like he's where we where we're going to be waiting for these waves so I just went like full sprint for like the first 30 <laughs> seconds and then Josh like as I'm like kind of starting to burn out you know <laughs> that freaking Josh just like strokes by and they're Blind just going by. and then Jocko's just looking back he's like gotta go about 200 more yards and I was just thinking like for <laughs> And dude, like, for bro, I was going into like, I was, I was saying this kind of stuff, like, bro, you got to give me like two minutes of hard path. Right I was in that mode. You know what I'm saying? That kind like, of like two minutes and it's dude, over. Two minutes, you got to get out fast because he was kind of in the lineup, like not long. Sorry, he was in the impact zone. Where he's yeah. getting, and, and all of a sudden, there's a lull, and I'm like. Because now I'm re- now I put everything together in my mind, and I'm thinking if this if this brother doesn't get out there like now, he's gonna be in here for a long time. So I'm like, you gotta give me like two minutes. Give me like two minutes of push of work. <laughs> it was, but see, I love like I love that. I love something that you know. It's just to me, struggle gives you it like gives you a purpose. You know, today. When we were waiting to come here, I just sat out there and watched those things, and I was, like, thinking about every mistake I made yesterday and how I would do it differently today. Paddling was one of them. Uh, but, like, even yesterday, Chalk was like, hey, dude, you know, just hit the garage for your workout. So I went down in there, and it's very different than mine, you know. So I'm kind of looking around, looking at the, you know, the tools, trying to figure out like what I can construct, you know, that day. So I freaking, you know, hit his rings for a while and stuff and, and, uh, did some kettlebells. But then I also thought like, you know, a lot of it's like freaking gorilla movements. So, you know, (laughs) his wife and girls had some bands over on the side, so (laughs) After I, you know, slung some kettlebells around for a while, I, you know, went and grabbed some bands and just did some like burnouts of, you know, shoulders and, and, you know, freaking arms and stuff, which I thought was, a, you know, I worked out for an hour. I was pretty happy with, you know, everything, but like, <laughs> dude, at like a, a hundred yards out, freaking trying to paddle that aircraft carrier. <laughs> and he's like. 200 yards, bro, and you got it. And I was just like, oh, my freaking triceps. You know what he said to me later when we got back? He's like, he's like, yeah, you know, bro, I mean, I just realized for the first time that, like, when you see a surfer, that guy's in, like, better shape than a wrestler. Like, he's in sick. You got to be in the sickest shape. Because that's how hard it was. In a way, yeah. In a way, but also not in a way. Let's yeah, face it. You yeah. can be like a fat old dude that surfs. Yeah. Like, I'll take to you to, yeah. They're just used to it and they got good technique and they yeah. just go out there and they don't even, you know, they don't even freaking try and they're out well, there. It's like when it. I give a bodybuilder, you know, a bow and watch him like struggle to get it back. And you're like, dude, this is a 70 pound dumbbell row right now <laughs> and you can't do it, you know? And then, cause, yeah. Cause, what is that? Is that that they don't have like the, the little stabilizer it, muscles or something? It's like, no, it's just like, it's just the understanding of like the technique of like where you're pushing and pulling and like mm. the leverage of it. Yeah. It'd be like, you know, it'd be just like walking up and even if a big dude, you said like, you know, hey, do a clean and jerk and you just like put 200 pounds on mm. there. You, do, I mean, it's just going to be a train yeah, wreck. They don't have the technique. Mm. Whereas you get a, a, a little female that knows how to do a clean and jerk. Yeah. She'll take that 200 and throw it up like it's nothing. Well, also, we talked about that on the mace today. We were talking yeah, about yeah. that. What, the swinging one? Yeah, the big mace. Yeah. That uh, for surfing, yeah, you're right. Like, actually, you don't have to be in that good of shape. You just have to be used to, because it's so repetitive. Like, just paddling, it's so repetitive. So it's like muscles. not knowing how to swim. Honestly, like, on that board, uh, 
I just felt like, you know, the first time, even if someone knows how to swim, you throw them in the water. If they don't know like stroke and like how to block and breathe and you're like taking on water in your mouth and you're like trying to blow that out and, yeah. you know, you're freaking sprinting when there's waves up. like, And it was like simple stuff. You know, I got my first ride in. I think I was on my, like I went up to one knee yeah, one and knee. then got up to one foot for a little bit. And then like as I'm going back out, I'm just, you know, Taking freaking, <laughs> taking them on the taking head. the straight line straight out, and I did that a couple times, and then I'm out there with Josh. Jocko had rode one in. I'm out there with Josh, and a couple like a big set came that were crashing kind of further out, and like as we're going up, he knew it was gonna like crash, and he goes, he goes, bro, when you go up, he goes, do a push up on your board right as you're hitting the right as you're hitting you know whatever he called it you know the flake or whatever the white water yeah he's like you know do a push up on your board and then it drives the nose down and then you can just ride the back and I like I freaking went up this thing and I'm just like <laughs> and rode down and I'm just like now you tell me dude <laughs> I freaking was taking like full endos just freaking one after another in the in the freaking mortar zone just taking heavy artillery Jocko and Josh are just out there like watch me just like you know he'll be back he'll be back out here at 15 or whatever yeah. <laughs> yeah. there's a lot of technique man and then there's he told me the you know the button hook method the channels yeah to like teach once about the channels. we got all the way out and climbed up on the rocks and we were there to take a picture of the three of us like up at the top of the cliffs and he goes see where all those are breaking he's like yeah don't that's, paddle out. He there. goes. That's he goes. That's why. Like I'd ride it out this way, and then I'd come in around the back of that. And then Josh, you know how Josh always rode out that way, and then he'd come around the back. He's like, you just kept going right up the middle. <laughs> I was like, man, you think you'd tell me that? Like ten minutes in, yeah, at least. Other time. You know yeah. what? As you said, there's like only so many things like the 97 things that i wanted to tell you or that josh wanted to tell you yeah that just didn't make the chart <laughs> yet and then once you once we realized that, okay he's going to be able to survive then that made it onto the freaking on the prioritize and execute thing don't just sit there in the impact zone and try and paddle out um <clears throat> hey so i going back to the business side of things because again to me that's one of the that's what makes us applicable. Well, that's what makes your story applicable in so many different realms is the the business side and the way you've set things up. You end you ended up eventually, kind of like I don't know if this was your 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 final move. But no, it's not your final move, but your one of your biggest moves was partnering up with with PSE. Yeah, I mean that definitely came later, but yeah, I mean there there came a point where. Our business had grown a really awesome community that was, you know, thriving for the educational content and then also like products that supported that educational content, um, which was all, you know, sharing side of the house. I was more, you know, I come up with things to talk about based on someone I'm working with at that time. But yeah, the brand became a community. You know, it became, you know, Sharon always said like, we're not, you know, we don't have fans. We have, you know, we have a community. Like we have, you know, we have a knock on nation. That, that's kind of what we referred to it probably five years ago, you know, five or six years ago, which uh, we just turned 10 years old. So, you know, halfway through we realized, you know, like what really fit our model. And then, yeah, one of the hard things for me, one of the hardest things is, you know, I'm a very loyal person. You know, and I've since I've also been I've worked internally at manufacturers, I look at, you know, ambassadors or external representatives in a different light than, you know, if someone's just out being an ambassador, you know, or a public figure, whatever, mm -hmm. the, whatever, you know, it's way different now. But when I was internal and we had pro staff, you know, you just you see what people do that really helps the company and makes you like never in question of should we get, you know, who are we going to keep around this year? I just knew those types of things, you know, to where if it was just like with, for me, like with my friendships, 
if it's a two way street, then you know that's a good relationship. But if it's all if it's always like you know there's always a give and a take, then you know that's just not like a healthy relationship. So like from like, a, like you built me a bow, you taught me how to shoot, you took me on hunts, and then I broke your neck. <laughs> that's that's a good relationship. Yeah, <laughs> that's how that's what I'm looking great. for. <laughs> that's that's exactly what I'm looking for. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of people don't know that, like, when you were here doing the podcast with Andy and Trevor, that was day one of jujitsu for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was actually in this room. I just couldn't talk because my <laughs> neck was broken. I was over in that corner just trying to get oxygen, freaking pull my esophagus off the back neck bone I had. <laughs> Meanwhile, you and Andy are just freaking laughing. Cutting happy. it up, man. <laughs> Check. All right. So so we form these really good relationships. Yeah. It's a yeah. two-way street, just like you and I got. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's always been tough when – when you change, you know, when you if you change brands, because I don't ever want it to be a ref- reflection of loyalty. But a lot of times, a lot of times, like the higher up you go in what you're giving someone or what they're giving you, there's obviously there's just more expectation and there's more, you know, I don't know. It's just like the higher up in rank you go, there's, you know, there's things that you need to do better than other people. And so, you know, when you climb to that spot, it's sometimes it's hard when you get to a, a higher level to then change because I don't ever want it to people to feel like I'm just making a change from a monetary point of view. Um, but for me, I had gone through two consecutive contracts that were multi-year contracts, and both of them kind of got cut when our business is trajecting, you know, in this format, but then, you know, they're like, well, you know, we're kind of plateauing from a marketing point of view and, you know, we're not getting added budgets, but we need to make room for other things. So they were always transparent, but it also became clear of, you know, we're trajectorying up and I want to, I want to provide more free content, but I can't provide free content to the consumer if I have no support from, Mm -hmm. You know, by the way, when you say your your trajectory is going up, you mean knock on knock archery. on archery is growing. You're getting more and more people following. There are more people watching your instructionals on YouTube. There's just a whole new archery pie. Like you know, people people within the the archery community, that pie would be like you know, local surfers around here probably you know that's probably a, a pie. Whereas if someone just really started focusing on you know teaching surfing to people like me, mm-hmm. you know, and I came in, they like start this whole other thing to where these people all over here are probably looking at it like, what's this guy even doing? You know, mm-hmm. why, why is he doing that? But the reality is, you know, we're kind of like baking a whole new cake mm-hmm. because the people that we're getting from the military and, you know, the people that we get from a lot of our mutual friends, like I'm beyond busy just with our just with people that we know mm-hmm. should be getting into archery, right? Yep. And uh, at the end of that contract, my last one, I kind of knew I need to open my ears to everybody because I had been with that company for 10 straight years, but I also had taken six years of, you know, to where things were plateauing and I could see there wasn't progression. So I listened to everybody and yeah, I mean, through everything there was, honestly, there was multiple deals that were better than where I was, but PSE came in and pretty much said like, we love what you're doing and we want you to support what we're doing, but we also want to give you the tools to where if you want to do more, we'll give you the tools for that. So they said, you know, if you feel like you want to create a bow that's specific to, you know, to your followers, or if you want to do something. And I said, well, you know, can I bring in a, a bow that's like at a budget price, you know? And they just said, yeah, you tell us what you want it to sell for, you know, we'll assign an engineer to you and you can, you know, you can do what, whatever you want. So it was, it was just, it was just a different door, you know, that got opened that allowed us to, go a direction with our brand that I feel good about. And I feel like, you know, I sleep well 
with just knowing that we're giving back a lot and yeah pse has been a huge part of that mm-hmm. you know they've just given me the tools you know the first bow we came out with is the one you and i shoot and then uh came out with another bow that was focused on you know a price to where you, the average person can go and get into archery with a really good setup but probably still less than what you could buy a surfboard for you know what mm-hmm. i mean um and then yeah we can choose our direction so it's been an it's been an awesome partnership and you know they're an america you know everything's made in america um for the stuff that you know we're designing and it's just it's really cool because it's actually the company my first bow was a pse and last year was their 50 year like anniversary so um and pse started in illinois like very close to where that road that I turned down was not very far from there. So there was just a lot of cool things like that, that, you know, a lot of times if things are meant to be, they happen. You know, I've just learned that, you know, if you force stuff, it's not for the right reasons. So I've, I've just really, I've been fortunate that I haven't had to make a decision based on like, I can't pay my bills if I make this decision. So I've always just let things unfold of, you know, really what's meant to be will be. And, you know, and I feel like I feel like my progression of shooting tournament archery and learning what I learned there and learning the connections and and growing up working with the manufacturer and seeing some of that behind the scenes stuff like all those were just sacrifices and building blocks that I had to do to get to where I really want to be. You know, I never, I never wanted to be the best tournament archer. I never really wanted to be, you know, I didn't want to just work in an archery, you know, manufacturer or, you know, go to all the, the shoots. I just, I love hunting. I love teaching. You know, I like, I like going to new spots and seeing new things and having new challenges. So, you know, that that's kind of what it's done for me. Yeah, and what I like about it, and I remember as this deal was unfolding, you were telling me what it was like, and it's like, it's a true partnership. Like you said, you're allowed to go in there, you can help design exactly what it is you want, it's your name going on these on this equipment, so it's like you can't be any more invested in this company, which is which is awesome. Yeah, it's, it, and w- the other thing too is, everyone needs to remember, you know, if you can't shoot it well, there's no purpose to it. So like through that whole process, I got equipment from all these companies that I really hadn't done a, hadn't done a lot of due diligence shooting to where I, you know, cause I'd only shot two other archery brands really at, from a like professional level, each one for about a decade. So, um, I shot other competitors to know what they felt like, but that doesn't mean I knew what they would do like in my hands every day. So I needed to know that. And right away after three or four days, I thought this is a seriously underrated product, you know, and I went out there and and met with them and they talked about a lot of things that they wanted to do, especially like at that 50 year, you know, they wanted to, you know, make some changes from the sales point of view. They wanted to make some marketing decisions that were different. You know, they said, you know, we want to be able to to hit some like niche markets, which for them, our community was a niche market, which I think was very underrated. You know, now, now I think they realize, you know, what the impact is. Um, but yeah, it really gave the ability for me to take people that had incredible ideas internally and, and awesome patents, which, you know, for me would be hard to go out on my own and do it. Um, because I'd have to work around so many things that now that I've shot their bows, I personally like, so, you know, I would be trying to figure out a way around what they've solidified as a, you know, as a proven design. So, it just, it was a, it, for me, it was a plug and play. Like, and, and that's what it, it had to be because, you know, we've worked really hard, Sharon and I, to, you know, really stay on our path at Knock on Archery because there's, there's been a lot of opportunities to, you know, maybe, I don't know if sell out would be mm-hmm. like the term, 
because it probably wouldn't be that drastic, but we could have definitely made a lot more decisions that would have put our following secondary to decisions that we made. Mm -hmm. And the PSE um, collaboration was a, was a, an awesome plug and play for us. And I think as a, especially me, I feel like I was an athlete that built a career out of the discipline of athletics, honestly. Um, I feel like those are the little things in business, you know, especially now, like so many people build business based off social media or, you know, maybe they've, you know, maybe they've been with Origin for, you know, using your geese for a year and you guys have been good to them and you're, you're laying down foundation to get to where you want Origin to, to go. But then, you know, brand Y comes in and says, well, you know, we're not just going to give you a discount on a gi. We'll give you a gi. And, you know, I was always at the, the mindset of, okay, if I get a gi, do I, one, do I really need to get a free gi if I've got one, even though I had to buy it from origin, you know, and okay, let's say I take the free gi. Well, now I've like also started a brand new relationship. So, you know, I think we made a lot of really good choices by weighing out like long-term relationships that understood the direction we needed to go, but we weren't there yet, but they were going to help at a rate that they could to where we could get to our goal versus like, you know, a lot of startups are the perfect example of like, you know, they wait, they make a lot of dumb decisions as I did as a business you know, giving stuff away to the wrong people. And those, those places come and go all the time. And I think as like an, you know, an ambassador type figure or whatever, you can, I think think Andy likes to call them influencers. That's what hashtag influencers. Yeah. (laughs) Which, yeah, that's your (laughs) official (laughs) hashtag for Andy and I. Uh, But yeah, you could, you know, you can burn a lot of bridges and it's just my experience that a lot of these, you know, jujitsu, surfing, archery, the, they're like, they're small demographics. They're like small ecosystems. Mm -hmm. So it's like, there's only so many times you can burn a hole in the freaking ozone Mm -hmm. before eventually people are like, that dude just burning the planet down. If you know. Yeah. What I like about what you guys, what you and Sharon have done and I think this might be the, the biggest lesson that I look at you to try and pass on to the people is you guys have done the right things for the right reasons the whole time. You you have put the customer first, you put the clients first, you put the people that are watching your videos. I mean, there's, there's well, that's what you've done. That's what you've stuck to, making the best products you can, trying to get them at a good price point. I mean, for you to go to PSE and like say, okay, I could make Wonder Bow, you know, and, for, and this super high-end bow, but you went there and the first really, I guess the second move you make, because you, you did make that first bow that we're shooting, but then you said, okay, here's the first move. We're gonna make a bow that is affordable to people that still kicks ass. Yep. So I think one of, one of the lessons that I take away from this is like, if you're doing the right things for the right reasons, in the long run, strategically, you're gonna be better off than you know, trying to get, trying to maneuver real quick to make a little bit a buck here and a buck there. Like you said, you're burning a hole in the world that you have to live in, mm-hmm. and it ends up not working out well. Um, I I, I hate to ask you this because you've probably been asked this ten thousand <laughs> times, but look, we've been going for two and a half hours or something like that. But if someone is starting, if someone's like, "Hey, dude, this sounds awesome. I want I want to get into this. I want to get into archery. I want to get a bow. I want to." You know what? I want to go hunting. I want to be freaking stalking around in the forest <laughs> with cami paint on my face. Like I'm in. I want to get into it. What What do you recommend? How do you How do you go about that? Well, I think first you should just you know Google you know Google archery shops and look at ratings. There's you know some areas are very fortunate to have an ar- an awesome archery shop that you know has amazing you know entry level you know, classes and programs like that. Um, but also like, especially from our point of view, knock on is, you know, we offer free, you know, lessons and content. I just put out a series, you know, archery one oh one, 
with uh, you know Mark Shanker from Kicks Band because you and I are both were like freaking <laughs> hair slingers from the eighties. Uh, no, you're thinking of Leif Babin. Leif Babin was a hair slinger. Was he? Not me. I wasn't listening to freaking Poison like you were. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll give that to you, bro. <laughs> Hold what you got. <laughs> you know you did. <laughs> no offense against kicks, but they weren't in my freaking tape deck. <laughs> what was your top three before we go uh, any further? Black Sabbath, Motorhead, Led Zeppelin, ACDC, and then just straight into all the hardcore stuff that I grew up on, Chromags. Bad bra- bad brains, agnostic front, right on down the line. Who wants some? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you wanted that easier listening, you had alternatives. But uh, no, I we did a we did. I just thought it was a really cool story because, you know, he's he's later in life decided to pick up jujitsu. You know, went down that path. You know, wanted to honestly wanted to like get away from factory farming, mm-hmm. and so decided to go down the archery path and, you know, wanted to like get good enough to where he could, you know, get his own food, so to speak. So it was really cool. And we documented that and that's, you know, it was like a three part series, which takes someone from who had never pulled the bow back and just walked, walked him through like, you know, same thing I did with Helen. Yep. Right. Yep. You know, and same learning thing you on do a with string. I, I didn't know anything about archery. You again, man. So thankful that you decided, like, hey, you will, you are gonna really like this stuff because you heard me on Rogan, and you're like, this guy needs to get a freaking bow. So you set it up. You came out here, freaking, uh, like, what do they say? Like, oh, it's not gonna come to you on a silver platter, yeah. right? In life, things are gonna come to you on a silver platter. I literally got archery on a <laughs> silver platter, and I know it. To everyone out there that's like, this son of a bitch just had freaking Dudley build my bow and then teach him. Like, that's what happened. I know. I'm sorry that I got that freaking lucky. <laughs> you know, my buddy Jack Daniels at, at, at Echelon Front, you know yeah, Jack? Hill. Bro, he he's like, man. <clears throat> yeah. He's like, he's like, man, Dudley taught you how to shoot, man. He's like so freaking pumped. Um so I know that I know that I got that, but one but I, I didn't even watch any of your videos. Mm-hmm. Like before you came out to teach me. And so then immediately I go home and I'm like, all right, what are these videos that he's talking about? And I'm like, oh, that's ju- literally just what he told me to do. Yep. Like I went through and I'm like, oh, this is what you, so anybody that's thinking I got so lucky, I did, I'm not taking that away, but you can get just as lucky by going and pressing freaking play on a YouTube video yep. and you're gonna get, you said the exact same things to me. You're like, hey, this is what you need to do. Here's where you start. Here's the string. Here's this. And I'm like, okay, cool. And I'm doing it. And then I go home and watch the videos. I'm like, that's what he just told me. He could have just sent me the YouTube link. Yeah. He didn't have to fly out here to San Diego. <laughs> so every you, the, the fact that you've given access to your actual program of coaching, and it's available to anybody. Yep. It's available to anybody. So And on our YouTube channel. You and I parallel each other in that format. Like, um, and I heard you talk about it in the past. You've talked about, you know, like, you know, for extreme ownership, right? When you first started doing it and you would, you know, probably when you started, you would get cash by going in places and doing that presentation, which is kind of like when I used to travel Europe and like my slideshows, you know, if people took pictures of them, it kind of weirded me out. Like, I need to be booking the, you know, I need to book another spot. That's how I'm paying for my bills, you know. But then it gets to the point where you realize, no, actually, the more people you're helping, the more people that want to dive deeper. So, you know, there came a point for me where I kind of knew I was going down the right road when people that were on higher levels were getting mad at me because they're like, don't show them how to do mm-hmm. that. You know, why are you showing them how to do that, dude? You know, and because the U S was so dominant in archery competition for a long time and in the compound bow category. And so like learning that ranging system mm-hmm. on the unknown things, like, you know, that was never tell anyone that mm-hmm. sort of thing. Um, but just all these small little things, you know, we'd go to another country and see him like p- 
punching triggers or something. And, you know, my buddy would look at me like, you freaking talk to them about punching that trigger, and I'm going to punch you in the face, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's freaking nuke these people. Uh, so, but, yeah, I just felt like um, the more I the more I gave away, it's also a really good filter because you really start to see how many people are absorbing what you're saying and not, you know, not being an asshole where they're just asking and they never apply, ask, never apply, never apply. You see people where you look at them and you're like, oh, hey, man, when did you start shooting that silverback? And they're like, yeah, I watched, you know, video, blah, 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 and I've been working on it and I think I'm getting better. And meanwhile, I know this because I'm seeing, you know, what I try to teach being applied by someone that I know I didn't directly Mm -hmm. tell it to. So then naturally it's like, well, hey, let me give you a little bit, you know, let me help you progress progress this a little bit. And I feel like um, for you and I both, you know, we just got to the point where we, where we realize lay it all out there. And yeah, there's, there's certain places that will say Dudley will give you anything to, to come out here and like do it in person and blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah. And yeah, I've got people, um, you know, we've auctioned a couple bows that have gone, you know, for a lot, for good, always for a good cause. Um, but we, we auctioned a bow, a bow that went for a lot uh, for the Navy SEAL Foundation mm-hmm. to get to that million dollar March to a million mm-hmm. mark. And, uh, you know, even though it was a raffle, you know, people still, well, you know, not everyone's got 20 bucks to buy a bunch of raffle tickets. And it's like... You know, you can't make everyone happy, but the reality is, you know, if someone really wants to go through and put it all together, they can, you know, they can read all these and, you know, so many different things that I've heard you talk to people, you know, and and give them, I don't know, you people will come and be like, hey, you know, Jocko, give me some advice about this. And then, you know, I'll go through and look in here and I'm like, oh, yeah, well, you know, yep. I've heard him apply that exact same thing. Yep. And they acted like, you know, he just told them something that's never been said. And it's like, actually, it's if they, the if, yeah, if they would follow that, like, yeah. you know, I'm a broken record when it comes to archery. I've, I've boiled down a recipe to, you know, what I feel is like a balsamic glaze. It's like the good <laughs> stuff, you know, and I know like what can make most archers who are brand new be at a a very high level fast and eliminate a lot of mistakes. But, you know, whether you watch every video I have or read all those articles or you come in person now, granted, it's easier for me to see in person a breakdown, which that is the benefit to being in person. You can directly connect like right away. You're not having to figure out what am I doing wrong and research it. Mm-hmm. But other than that, like we put it all out there. If I learn something new or if we come out with a new product, then, you know, we're we're going to put it out there. And most of everything we do is always – it's always a, deri- a derivative of – a need that I see that we can help with. Um, and I remember specifically like on that bow that we were talking about, uh, I have chalkboards all around me. Like you've been to my house and stuff. Most anywhere where I, if I sit down and I'm in there very long, there's chalk, you know, most of my walls are just painted with chalkboard paint because I just write stuff down. So I don't forget it. But I remember like meeting this person that kind of said like, Hey, you know, I'd love to embark on an archery journey. Where do I start? And so I remember like writing that down, which is the name of that bow is embark because I'm like, you know, embark on your first archery journey, Mm -hmm. embark on your first bow hunt, you know? Um, so a lot of the things that we put out there are because there was a need, you know, my subject matter, comes from someone's problem that I need to help them fix. Yeah, and that, I've been the subject of that a few times on your social media. You're like, hey, I was start looking at Jocko's shot. And he's doing this. And I'm like, there you go. And, and it's awesome, you know, and, and, and that's the way it should be. You know what's funny is, well, it's not funny, but probably like the third podcast that we were doing, or maybe the fourth, something, but very early on in the podcast, I remember I had been asked a question about leadership and I was going to give the answer and I was like, 
this answer that I'm about to give is like very, very, very valuable. And it didn't, it wasn't like I had a major debate in my mind, but it was more just an acceptance. It wasn't like I said, maybe I shouldn't give it away. But it was more like I said, when I give this away, this is giving away something very, very valuable, and I and that's what I'm gonna do. Yep. Like maybe there was a little bit like, well, you know, because I look, I have a leadership consulting company. Yeah, right. That's what I do is I do leadership consulting. If I'm just you know, hey, go go ahead. I'm just gonna give away all the answers for free. Well, maybe that's not a good idea. And I don't. If I had that thought, it was like a split second, and I realized it was like, no, actually every possible thing that I can give to people to help them, that's what we're doing. That's what I'm doing. Yeah. And, and and that's what you do. And like you said, what it helps is that solves, look, no one in life is gonna get to the end of their problems, right? Mm-hmm. No one's gonna get to a point where they just like, oh, I don't have any problems anymore with leadership, right? Oh, I've got everything figured out, no one. And so, there's, so you solve a bunch of their problems, cool. Then guess what? Now when you work with them, you can do a problem that's actually a little bit more complex. Yeah. It's actually a little bit more challenging. You know, like I get kind of like you, you get asked, "Hey Dud, you know, I'm I'm I, you know, sometimes I I hit a little bit low to the left." And they're thinking that that's the first time you've ever been asked that. You know what I mean? <laughs> or they say, "Hey, you know, I once I'm sitting on a target, I start my my I start to my hand starts to shake a little bit." Like they're thinking that this is only happening to them. You've been asked that question 15 million times, <laughs> right? It happens to me too. Like, you know, hey Jocko, I know you talk about cover and move, but sometimes the people I'm working with, they don't really, you know, they don't want to do their part. So how does that even work? It's like I've been. They think that that's the only time that's ever happened, and it's actually happened 15 million times that I've been asked. That that question so give it away give away as much as you can to people and that elevates everybody and that means they're they're seeing value in what you're doing and they're appreciative and now guess what they get their problems prop that problem solved cool if they never have a problem again that's great cool yeah. that's great good for them that's awesome I'm happy someone else is gonna have that problem I'm gonna learn by the way it's just it's just a it's doing the right things for the right reasons like I said earlier if you're doing the right things for the right reasons it's gonna pay off in the end you and I are really similar in a lot of ways. Like, you know, right now, Sharon and I are staying, you know, in your old house. Mm-hmm. Um, so just lurking around and, see, you know, seeing some of your stuff. I mean, you're you're not like a gadgety person. You're very, like, even your weights are, mm-hmm. you know, the first one you got at eBay or where, you know, before <laughs> eBay when you walked into freaking Second Wind Fitness or whatever. And, freaking bought this rusty old freaking <laughs> thing you got uh but you I don't keep it freaking old school <laughs> you do what <laughs> you do <laughs> everything you do is that way but i'm glad you knew that the bands you used to work out were not mine <laughs> <laughs> they were my wife's and daughters <laughs> <laughs> but i think uh your consistency with like you get good at the tools you have and you you build yourself around those tools you don't get tools to try to continue to make you better you know you're not like looking for the cheat code looking for the cheat code yeah i know you talk about that looking for a hack like oh this if i get this it'll make me a little bit it'll make it a little bit easier now i'm glad we're not talking about surfboards because you also saw my amount of surfboards i have which is kind of (laughs) freaking ridiculous yeah (laughs) yeah surfboards is it's like a freaking junkyard of surfboards all over the place yeah and there's a little bit of an excuse for that because different waves require different boards. Yep. And there's a lot of different waves to surf. I so. mean, my archery room looks very similar to that. But I don't change unless there's a change needed for the application. Now, one of the things with me is I never really had great continual coaching. A lot of the things that I teach are from mistakes. Like no one ever told me why I missed low left. I had to figure that out. Mm-hmm over a lot of frustration. And so like once I've learned those things, everything I boil down is to try to help eliminate those mistakes and learning curves, you know. Shouldn't say it's cheat codes, but just like me uh, freaking surfing yesterday, I do try to take a direct line of attack. (laughs) (laughs) So my coaching method is very direct line of attack of attack to where you're eliminating mistakes, but like getting to that particular point of topic as efficient as possible to where you're not expending 
valuable energy in that archery shot. Mm-hmm. Um, I just want to make sure we capture a couple things here. So I'm never done archery before, and I want to get into archery. What's we 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 look for a good archery shop? We read the reviews. We, what's a good amount of money to spend on that first investment? Is it better to go and like, hey, should you go and try? Like, hey, can I try a bow? Like, let me shoot some, and see what it feels like in the shop, just to just to make sure you're like, oh yeah, this is freaking cool, or is it like, you know, spend a thousand bucks, spend eight hundred bucks? What's going to get you in the game? Well, I think if you go there and you you try it, most archery shops are going to let you try it a little bit. I think that would be valuable. And be really specific to them to where you're new, you want to make sure you buy equipment that's very suited for you as a beginner. Um, And one of the examples of that is when you buy a bow, they have like, you know, they all have pulling weight. So when you pull them back, you know, it takes a certain amount of strength to pull Mm -hmm. them back. I'm real strong. Yeah. I want 500 pounds. (laughs) Yeah, that's Jocko walking in. (laughs) Uh, But a beginner, like our wives, for example, if they went into a lot of shops, some shops, especially if they were excited and just wanted to buy it right then, they would make do with equipment that they have and like, size it down for them versus I would way rather say, Hey, I'll wait a couple weeks to order something to where, you know, it's my pull weight. The bow is the right size for me because they can always make it work. But, you know, getting the right equipment off the get go and being upfront with them of, Hey, I I really want to do this. I enjoy it. I want the right equipment. And it's my personal belief that if you get in on like the lower end stuff, you're gonna, you can progress really fast with archery. So what'll happen is you're gonna do it just a short period of time and realize I'm actually better than this beginner piece of equipment. And then you realize the value of beginner equipment is kind of a poor investment because it's just, you're gonna sell it for Mm -hmm. way less because everybody got that cheap, entry point um so like with the bow that we did the embark that bow allows you to get a bow at a price to where you can put some really high-end accessories on it because the accessories can carry over it'd be like Mm -hmm. you know if you went and got a you know a cool freaking ar but then like you you know shot your wad on buying that thing so then you went you know you went and bought a nebesky Mm-hmm. And then you're like, well, I got 50 bucks left and you got to borrow your buddy's like Red Rider BB gun like <laughs> scope that came on it to like put on your Novaski. That's going to be a problem. So I tell people, you know, get high end accessories, get, you know, quality arrows, high end accessories, get a bow that's in the middle of the road to where if you move up in that bow, you can transfer your accessories over, which, mm-hmm. you know, we we've done with you. You know, Mm -hmm. we can transfer the accessory. I went high end on your accessories because you don't want accessory, like you don't want your site moving. Mm -hmm. You know, if if your site's moving around or if your arrow rest is moving around, then there's none of us that are going to know how well you're really shooting because there's just continual variables. But I think think for a thousand bucks, you can get in to where you can get in and stay in Mm -hmm. without having to re-up and re-up and re-up. Um, but you want something that has the ability to, especially if you're still growing, you want to have a cam system that, and that's kind of the pulley looking things Mm -hmm. on the bow. You want to be able to have something that's adjustable. And especially when you're learning, like as a coach, I'm not going to be hypersensitive of you being exactly your draw length, which is like your posture when you're at like a full draw position with your bow pulling it back because you can pull a bow back to different lengths. There's a good chance that your technique is going to slightly change over the course of getting better to where you might need to make some adjustments with that. So having something that has the ability to adjust is also awesome, which you get when you mm-hmm. spend. You know, it's kind of like I think – there's like hundred dollar increments. Like you can get a bow for four hundred bucks, but you're going to be limited, you know. And then, 
I think once you get to like six ninety nine, seven ninety nine for the bow only, you're in a, a really good position, and then put good accessories on it, and you know you'll be enjoying it for like a while. That that level bow, like the Embark, like you you go out and hunt with that thing. This is this yeah. Is I'll, like, t- I'll I'll shoot one day at the tax. Will be with an Embark, and then one day I'll be with an NTN. Mm-hmm. Like when I, you know, I, and last year, um, I took that bow, you know, on one of my most memorable hunts, you know, because I, I've always, that's one thing I've always done is I want people to feel like, even though for a particular brand, they have a low end model, a mid grade model and a high end model. I've always put some of those budget bows to a test and I've used them because I want, I don't want people to feel like they can only mm-hmm. shoot archery if they have the best gear. I've proven time and time and time again that that middle range is a, is a very good place to get in. And you can, honestly, you can stay there and be totally okay. But you know, it's no different than, you know, there's a lot of cars that are awesome, but you know, I like my Ram, but I might want that Hellcat Ram, <laughs> <laughs> even though technically it drives the same. Yeah, <laughs> right on. Well, I think that's uh, that's good info, and I'm sure a bunch of people, it's probably good, yeah, we're approaching three hours right now, but I just wanted to make sure, people are gonna get interested in this. I, I want people to, and by the way, you have all this information on, on your YouTube channel about like well, how to get started, what to look for, everything from freaking arrows to the book like everything so yeah it's it's all out there if you want to go a little bit deeper um but yeah man i I, obviously i appreciate you coming on but man i appreciate i appreciate what you're doing what you're doing for veterans you know that are out there what you're doing for your whole community of people that are making their life better because they're out there they got they got a mission and and absolutely what you've done for me helped me out delivering silver platter bow hunting to me which again i'm sorry for everyone for being so spoiled uh i'm lucky and i appreciate it but man it's been awesome and and i want to help get other people heading down that path because man i think it's beneficial in so many different ways man yeah it is 100 percent. i think it's an awesome an awesome sport especially for people that come from your background um who are looking for a new mission you know you said it perfectly because with all of you guys who have done it, you know, learning a new discipline or a new trade is one thing, but then once it comes to like packing up to freaking go on call, that lights a whole different intensity where, you know, hey, we're meeting, you know, we're we're out at dark, Mm -hmm. back at dark, and when you're out there, you know, geared up and freaking ready to get after it, you know, I remember the first time you and I went out and we were on that hillside glassing mm-hmm. and you just said, bro, this freaking, this is recon right now. <laughs> like, you know, I'd have a team right over there. There'd mm-hmm. be freaking two dudes right there. They'd be like, you know, back up and then we'd be here and like the, you know the shit would be all pulled over tight you know it was you were in your element just dorking out you know? yeah well you were head freaking dork on the scenario so it's all good awesome man echo yes, sir. charles yes, sir. you can see what kind of focus and consistency it takes to uh to approach excellence in any element Cognitive focus. But the pursuit never stops. The pursuit of excellence doesn't stop. What suggestions do you have uh, to well, get us moving in the right direction? Many. You know, we're, we talked about uh, being an athlete, right? The importance, the value of being an athlete, which I, I was was with you the whole time. I agree fully. But we don't want to stop that just because we get older and take on other responsibilities. Are you getting older? Well. That's got to suck. It's just one of those <laughs> things, man. The life I live. Nonetheless... <laughs> We gotta stay in the game even on our off time. There's no off time on time, there's just time. Something like that. Nonetheless, we have things to help you through this journey, supplementation. First thing, you talk about focus, we have discipline. 
discipline. I'm glad go. I was able to look at you just to get you on track, bro, because you were starting to stray wide. Well, whatever you guys, you guys are talking about all this. Cool I could stuff. probably chime in on a few things because I can tell you like <laughs> three things that are pinnacles for me from you know from origin, Cold War, freaking joint warfare, and the vitamin D mm. freaking have powered through COVID. You know, COVID year was like. No factor. No factor. But Same. I was those those three for me are every day. They're like right next to my cup of coffee to where I know I'm getting after it first thing in the morning. Yeah, that's um those are those are freaking legit. The joint warfare is the the go read the reviews on joint warfare. Don't listen to me. Who am I? I'm free. I own the company. Of course I'm gonna <laughs> tell you it's good, right? Go read the reviews from other people and what it does to them and what they say that grandmother started taking it and now all of a sudden, you know, she's whatever, playing tennis again and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. But this is the, the whole purpose, yeah, you own the company. Mm -hmm. Cool. But the whole purpose that you have this stuff is because that was like your pursuit even before that. True. Like, yeah, you got to take the stuff, krill oil, uh, you know, all the ingredients, you know, and then, well, you added some ingredients in the we joint did. warfare we stepped that to, up. to make that because, one better. Because why not? Like, it's not like, oh, I'm just going to take, no, make it better. Yeah. Make it the best possible thing that you can put into your mouth. To make sure. your freaking joints bulletproof, son. Yeah, yeah, it's true. And I'm, I'm with you with that that combo every day. Um, the Cold War, not as much. That That's kind of a seasonal thing. Don't like the cold? Super krill, too. Get that krill oil on, man. Yeah. Get them little fish down. What are they, fish? No, little shrimp. Little right? shrimps, little tiny kinda, shrimps. Kind of like shrimps, yeah. Uh, fish oil, good, too, though. You know, might want to look at Fish oil is good. Yeah. You're right. Chopper there is, is a label better. reader, I will there say. Is something. Like, there, if there, it's in there, he's he's read it and researched yeah, yeah. it. There's a reason that we see fish oil is like whatever. That's your freaking four hundred dollar bow. Yeah, krill oil. Oh, that's the entry or the krill oil is the freaking top of the line. Gotcha. It's the top of the line. Super krill is where it's at. <laughs> yeah, I understand fully. Um, I mentioned the discipline. Discipline. Go. Look. look hey. Look. Some of us are into energy drinks, but we're, really we're not into energy drinks. We're into the idea of energy drinks. And what they don't tell you about the whole energy drink thing is that there's poison inside. Mm. Straight up. Normal energy drinks. Yeah. Tradish. Tradish. That's why. Drink. Yeah. So this is the upgrade. This is the, I don't know, whatever you guys call I, the I upgrade. See, no, I don't even think it's an upgrade. I think it's new category. Yeah. It's new category. It's yeah. like, oh, we're over here drinking poison. You're over here drinking something that's awesome for you. Clean, <laughs> clean alternatives <laughs> is like a long overdue category for because think of how many guys went in and got after it in victory and then walked out and just grabbed <laughs> dog crap in a plastic bottle yep. to like have something on the way out the door yeah. it is way past due yeah way past due yeah it's almost like and I'm not as in touch with it but I'm a, you know I'm a casual we'll say but it seems like the whole energy casual drink, what it's I mean, besides life, yeah, everything. <laughs> what else? All of the above. You said you're a casual. What are you talking about? A fan you, of oh, energy drinks. Oh, before you were. See, if it wasn't for me being on deployment, like, like with with energy drinks and needing them because I need. It's like, hey, I'm freaking wicked tired, yeah. and I've been awake for 48 hours, and I need caffeine into my system. That's why I started drinking energy drinks, and then. But what do you deal with? You deal with, the, oh, I got done drinking the energy drink. Now I, I don't have I'm that freaking high anymore. Hours. And now I feel yeah. like dog shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's exactly because what there's I'm a bunch of junk in there. That's exactly what I'm saying. And you're talking about like extreme What about stuff? when you were in the club? <laughs> what about you when you were freaking doorman of the year or whatever? I never, I never, <laughs> I never got into energy drinks as much. Uh, you know, every once in a while yeah. or whatever. I just drink coffee because they have coffee available. Uh, okay. So whatever. As far as staying up. No, but I'm talking about like activity. You're talking about going on deployment, all this I stuff. I don't like the taste of coffee. Okay. Yeah, I understand, sir. I was talking to Evan. And Evan's like, bro, he's like, he's like, you know, I, I want to get bring you up to Utah, and I, you know, I'm gonna figure out what, what um, coffee, you know, what coffee you like. There's, you know, there's got to be a way. You know, he's like a, he's like a, a, a sommelier of the yeah, Java bean, right? And he's like wanting to create it. <laughs> the and Java. I, so he was texting me this. He's like, yeah, man. Javier. He's like, come to Salt Lake, man. I'm gonna get you the, you know, the. the 
the bean that you like and the roast that you like and all this stuff. I text him back, I go, bro, I don't even like coffee ice cream. Good luck. <laughs> and he started yeah. laughing. Yeah. But that's kind of an important factor right there because coffee like coffee's like beer, where it's like at the end of the day, you're always gonna have the beer flavor there's a beer flavor yeah. it's like there's a coffee yeah, 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 flavor yeah, 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 yeah. and then from that flavor yeah. then if you it get wasn't, all the different if it varietals or if whatever it wasn't I don't know whatever tasting like coffee it wouldn't be coffee exactly if right. you made it with freaking cocoa beans it wouldn't be coffee <laughs> Yes, exactly. Right? If you right. made it with tea leaves, it wouldn't be coffee. Correct. Yeah, exactly. Right. Or, or strawberries or whatever Evan was trying to put yeah. on your, your flavor. We'll see. Palette, I don't whatever. know. He's a freaking, he's into it, man. He Maybe he can pull it off. We'll see. If it's chocolate I'll, peanut butter, you uh, might be all over I'll, that. I'll, I'll, <laughs> well, that's like yeah. you with milk, bro. Like I sent you like a whatever. You got some milk and then like two weeks later, you're like, hey, bro, what? you're like a freaking crackhead. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> bro, we need some more of milk of in here, man. I was like, dude, yeah. all right, we'll get you some Free more base in that freaking <laughs> milk, dude. Yeah, it's true. But the energy drinks is like a lot of these activities that they're sometimes, in my observation, mm-hmm. which is limited, I know, but in my observation, it's associated with these activities that are kind of, let's just say they would benefit more from a healthy Oh, for sure. Fuel for sure. source. Yeah, why would you be doing out something that's physically demanding yeah. and putting poison in your body? So you, okay. Don't you, do it. You go to Big Sky or mm-hmm. whatever, you know that hill, you're always sending me videos of you guys charging or whatever. Mm-hmm. What's it called? The Big? It's I don't a, know. What it's it, a mountain. <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah. It's not a, <laughs> it's not a hill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, of course. Walk well, up what that is that thing called? Once, <laughs> tell me if it's <laughs> a hill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bro, when I ran up that thing after you and I were like, kept walking down that mountain every yeah. day and be like, man, this would be a good workout. When I went, when I went and did it, I was like, yo, Yep, confirmed. <laughs> that sucked. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. So, so, and you you ride the lift up there. Okay, so in the snow, we'll mm-hmm. say, if you're really used to it, okay, good. But just being in the snow, just like just being in the ocean or on deployment or, or in the in the woods. Pardon my lack of terminology, mm-hmm. but um, it is technically it being, is woods. Yeah. Okay, just being there, bro. It, it's like that's in and of itself is a thing. Like you can't, you're not just cruising. You're just, you're working. Right. See what I'm saying? Okay. And then it. you're I doing your activity on top of that. Mm-hmm. And whether you're in big sky, you know, the woods, the water, whatever, like, bro, you're going to, you're not going to want poison no. in that scenario right there. No. Or no even n- anything that you're going to pay the price later or something like that. And it's not needed. You don't need to. Not, you no. don't need to have poison. And that's why we the got discipline goes boom good stuff. in the house. Hey, Wawa, if you want this stuff, if you're on the East Coast, go to Wawa. And, you know, they were saying, they tried to pull the reins on us. They are like, don't. Don't tell everyone to clear the shelves. Stop, stop sending We're back. customers. That's what We're saying. back. See if you can run that supply chain into the ground. <laughs> I, I challenge you all to see if you can run that supply chain into the ground for me. See what happens. Mm-hmm. If you do, well, I'll figure something out. I'll do, what's something I could do? Like make a funny hat, put on a funny hat and do a video or something. <laughs> Grow like, those bangs back. Go yeah, yeah. Prince Valiant haircut back. <laughs> that ain't happening. <laughs> I, to me, Grow those it, bangs to back. To me, hair, it was so, it's bothersome to me when my hair is like a quarter of an inch long or whatever. <laughs> like it already bothers me. So go, going that distance would freaking drive me crazy Unacceptable. Now. Yeah. yeah. But either uh, way, I'm sure you figure something out. Uh, yeah, vitamin shop, and there's a subscription scenario. Going on. You don't want to run out of that uh, that that everyday um, supply, you know. Jockofuel.com, which by the way is where you need to go. I to think get I this call, stuff. they call it the good good. <laughs> What's the good good? <laughs> Hell yeah. That's subscript. Oh, yeah. The <laughs> subscription. Well, here's Hell the deal, yeah. man. We're we're not, look, we're not alone in the world. Promo there's, code good, good. There's, yeah, there's yeah. capitalism out here. We're mm-hmm. competing on an open market. We're competing with some people that are pretty big. Mm-hmm. So, when you compete with people that are pretty big, you got to figure out how you're going to make something happen. So what we want to do is free shipping, right? Because people are very used to free shipping because there's some companies out there that do free shipping. And so how, do we, how can we make that happen? The way we made it happen is if you get subscriptions to any of these products, they'll boom, shipping's free. There you go. All right, cool. Uh, also, originusa.com. Okay, this is where you can get American-made stuff. From jujitsu stuff all the way down to non jujitsu everyday stuff, mm-hmm. like for real everyday stuff, like jeans, like jeans, like a boots. wallet, like boots. boots. Yeah, still only, waiting they, on my hat, Pete. Which hat? A beanie? A, a ball cap? No, the, you know the one that he wears. We both oh, wore that. What the do flat, they call the flat those? cap? Those are called a flat cap. But they're like kind of the Frenchy ones. No, yeah, it's, like, it's like a, it's called a flat cap. It's not like a fedora. Or no, whatever. it's a, it's called a flat cap. It's like what you see like a yeah, a little British one. dude wear. Dude, right? yeah. I, Andy yeah. got me one in France, a camo one that I wear sometimes, and it's a made up camo flat cap. Hell yeah. yeah, dude. 
Okay. Legit. And it's made out of like sweatshirt material hmm. and it's freaking comfy on your head. I hunted with it. I told Pete, like, make me that out of my origin hoodie material. Because that hoodie is like the, my favorite thing I wear around the house every day. Oh, yeah. That thing's freaking. The freaking midweight, that soft ass one, is freaking <laughs> awesome. Right. I used to say it, most comfortable sweat suit ever in existence. Do they make pants to match that? Yeah, they do. Yeah. That yeah. are like longer than 28 inches. Or <laughs> oh, yeah. You got a, you got a situation. <laughs> but. We'll sew two pairs together for your freaking long ass legs. <laughs> True. I heard they or I saw they had some socks brewing. Yep, socks Ooh. are brewing. We're gonna make everything. Interesting. We're gonna make everything. Everything we're bringing it back to America. We're gonna make it so you can wear it, and we will make like they're making all these different like cool socks. But at yeah. some point, I'm just gonna make straight up white socks like you know I roll. <laughs> See, hey, you have a lot of good ideas. You do. <laughs> That one. The, when are you gonna make a jock strap? Uh, <laughs> I don't know, man. Dude, you need to make a jock strap. That, that's a good call, man. That's a great. I'm, that's a that's a great one. <laughs> <laughs> I've been hearing that joke since I was in third grade. <laughs> well, for good reason. <laughs> uh, but yeah, good. Yes, all American made stuff. Really good. Also, Jocko's store. It's called Jocko Store, and this is where you can get shirts and rash guards and hoodies and hats and stuff that are representative of the path directly and then there's the shirt locker which this is how this is what savage people name are too yeah by the way this is what this is how savage people are so we have this thing called the shirt locker where yeah. it's it's a subscription and if you're on the subscription you get like a one-off t-shirt yeah like if you have to be on like you can't go buy it later mm-hmm. so somebody's Actually, I think a couple people are already jacking the designs. I don't and even know how they're them. doing that. That de- it's not like that design is like on display. No, no somewhere. people people posted it. People posted the real one. So like, <laughs> and then the, then they jack it and they put it on these websites. Like, hey, it's freaking ridiculous. Yeah, so, that's, but here's, that's here's how savage thing. people. It are is out savage there. and it is lame, but it's there's like a few. You told violations. me the other day I only use the word savage in a negative, negative way, yeah. but I all. No, I no. definitely use it in a positive way. Yeah, <laughs> more often. I think you just you just more attuned to it because I say it with such dis like those just that's just yeah. what a savage. Yeah, when when somebody's like doesn't have the creativity to figure out how to make a cool T-shirt and sell it, instead they're just savages and just stealing a design. Yeah, what who does that? Yeah, it, it, yeah, it's, it's savages. It's, savages. <laughs> <laughs> now what's jacked up is you could also be like, oh man. Like, it can it can obviously be super positive thing. Like, oh, these do like you said earlier. You're like, hey, where the Guida twins are from, or where the Guida brothers are from. There's a bunch of savages in their neighborhood. They're wrestlers and they're fighters. And I was like, yeah, cool. Mm-hmm. I totally knew what you were talking about. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's one of those words that can go either way. But that's a compliment well. word. It, yeah. We've had many conversations where if Jocko says savage, it's. It's a high compliment for someone it, that doesn't know they just got one. It is yeah. a weird thing because I use it as the highest, com- one of the highest compliments <laughs> the and the, one of the lowest <laughs> insults I can give. It's literally the same word. Yeah. That dude's a savage or that dude's a savage. <laughs> what a freaking <laughs> bunch of savages. I don't know how they get the de- the design because it's not like, okay, like the one, okay, so h- hardcore recondos mm-hmm. are good or discipline equals freedom. You go to like, I don't want to tell anyone how to how to get it, but it's on display somewhere, you know. But the shirt locker ones, they tend they're not. There's oh, like you, a hint of them somewhere. No, but no, no. People are taking when they get their shirt locker shirt, oh, and they're they posting it. Oh, no, no, okay. they're posting it like, "Yo, got the new shirt locker shirt." Right. Oh yeah, and the, game but, over. Okay, <sighs> so how it. they how they do that, right? The the knockoffs, basically mm-hmm. the counterfeit pirated like designed shirts. <laughs> they go to one of these like internet yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, what do you call purchase by to Don't order give them the recipe or whatever <laughs> no you can do it but here's the thing. here's how bad it is if you if you know about it and you can if you just have like half a brain no offense to the people who bought those but you can tell but. you look at it and it's like this weird like mock up of the design on this real like real like 
what do you call it's it? Like Emaciated you, it's, model. It's like when you'd buy a Metallica t-shirt, like from some dude on the beach. Yeah. And it looks yeah. like there's like plastic stickers. Like, yeah, yeah, stuck, exactly. Stuck to your freaking shirt. Oh, yeah. Well, so, what I feel bad about is though, is I know that some people are doing like, they're like, oh, cool. Like I want to support because we're like you like, hey, yeah. man, if you want to support what's going on here, then you get some get some gear. Yeah. And so they actually are stoked like, oh, cool. I'm helping out, you know, yeah. the podcast. We're in the game. And then they realize they're giving their money to some freaking savage, some freaking <laughs> savage out there. That's Stop stealing. the savage support. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so and they, yeah, and they use like super. When I say substandard material, it's like you know, it's like the internet shirt that you print. Yeah, uh, like, you know, it's like that. And then they get Old that, and then it's paper. like well, not to mention there's more to it than just that front design. There's a lot more to it. Oh, there's, there's layers. Like layers. <laughs> there's little. There's little elements of the shirt. Yeah. If you examine it, you're like, oh, okay, yeah. I'm in the game with, with this shirt. Even even on a physical level, yeah. not to mention the phil- philosophical Damn. level, and you don't get that either, man. So it's brutal. Anyway, if you want, uh, if you want to get involved with the shirt locker or any of these other things, JockoStore.com. Also, we got, uh, you know, you should possibly subscribe to this podcast. But on, uh, but on top of that, so you have a podcast. There's yep. there's a there's a um, podcast. It's Knock On Podcast. Yeah, and. It's talking about archery, but it's not just talking about archery. You talk about you interview, you know, different cool people. dudes. Yeah. yeah, cool people, different people from different walks of life, how they got where they're at, where where they are. Of course, you do cover if you just want to get freaking granular <laughs> on some archery shit. Well, you can go. You'll get so granular you won't even know where you are anymore. <laughs> yeah, we've imploded friends that try to go too deep down the archery rat hole. Like we had one blow up today <laughs> <It's> just freaking <laughs> can't go that's too the deep thing, man you got to be careful man it's like crack dude you know like you got to be careful you start going down that rabbit hole next thing you know you look up and your world's exploded uh so yeah check out check out that podcast knock on podcast if you want to hear more about archery and just other aspects of life obviously you can subscribe to this podcast um we also have jocko unraveling i've been rolling out some some episodes with 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 uh daryl cooper which are, which are kind of some crazy episodes coming out, and they're just getting crazier. Him, we want to talk about. Me and him are like rabbit hole freaking uh, uh, point men in Nam, going deep <laughs> into <laughs> some mayhem with a with an angle flashlight and a forty five caliber pistol, and we're going down some holes that they're scary. So you can come check that out. We got the Grounded Podcast. We got the Warrior Kid Podcast. Uh, we can also you can also join us on the Underground for the Jocko Underground. Which is, it's just a little, it's a little like when you, wait, here's here's something you'll understand, Echo Charles. You used to work in the clubs, right? Yeah. Bro. You're in the clubs. Yeah, right? bro. You're in the yeah. clubs. I, don't, I wouldn't say. And there's like that, the but, front yeah. door, right? Where yes, people sir. are coming in, right? Yep. And they're feeling like, yeah, I'm oh, in yeah. the club. Yeah. But then there's also like a VIP scenario. Okay. There's I something understand. else going yes, on, yes, right? Sir. He calls yep. it the back door. Yeah. <laughs> So there's something else. Yeah. There's like a, a little bit more, yeah. right, going it's, on. Yeah. So we have we have the Jocko Underground podcast. JockoUnderground.com. If you wanna if you wanna come and hang out a little bit more, Echo and I are we're in there. We're chilling. We got bottle service back there. I guess <laughs> is that the type of thing that's going on? <laughs> yeah. There. Sure. There is bottle service going on. There's bottle service. <laughs> Metaphorically. Speaking. Metaphorically, because you can send a question. Yep. And and if you're in the underground, you can send a question. We're going through those questions. We're I'm putting out little um, other things that I'm diving into. Yeah, and they're interesting because they explain a lot. Like when you listen to it, you're mm-hmm. like, and you kind of put it all together. If you're one of those people who are like, oh, I see what he did there. And when you remember some stuff that you heard, you're like, ah, oh, and it starts to paint this bigger picture and explain a lot of the stuff. Yeah, there's a there's a holistic viewpoint that starts to come into the oh, yeah. horizon. So go to jockowunderground.com if you want to get in there. It costs $8.18 a month. We're trying to jack all your money. No, <laughs> if you can't afford it, go go to assistance at jockowunderground.com. But we do need to have a contingency in case things go sideways. In case freaking big brother comes down and just starts stomping out freedom of speech, we got to have a little access port to be able to still do what we're doing and put out the word we also don't want to have a bunch of uh of uh sponsors mm. that are saying um hey we don't want you to talk about this because we think it might be offensive to our brand we're not doing that mm. jockounderground.com uh youtube we got a youtube channel where echo puts up videos also uh, uh, all kinds of 
more information than you could shake a stick at, knock on archery. So check those out for a bunch of information. Also Origin USA has a little YouTube channel talking about what's going on up in Farmington, Maine. We got Psychological Warfare. What's that all about, Echo Charles? It's an album. <laughs> it's a Jocko album with Jocko tracks on it, helping us get through our moments of weakness if they may come about. Hundred yeah, percent effective, by the way. Excellent. We got some books. Final Spin. <sighs> it's a novel. It's kind of a novel. It's it's kind of crazy. It's cool. The final edits are coming back right now, um, and you always get like little comments and. We'll just say it's going to be interesting to see how this one hits. Oh, comments with the edits when yeah, they come people, back? Yeah, 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 but they'll, yeah. they'll put like something. They'll give you edits, but then they'll be like, I, you know, right, it's right. just like, yeah. So mm-hmm. we're getting, it's, check it out if you want that first edition. Leadership Strategy and Tactics Field Manual. The Code, the Evaluations, the Protocol, Discipline Equals Freedom Field Manual. Way of the Warrior Kid 1, 2, 3, and 4. Mikey and the Dragons. About Face by Colonel David Hackworth. You're going through that right now, right? Yep, three quarters of the way through, I guess. You're listening to it. Yeah. How's that? I listened to some of it. It seems like the guy is a pretty good reader. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, some of these readers are just offensive. Like, you listen to him and you're like, this guy is just picked this up for the first time. He has no idea what's going on, no context, and he's just reading the words on the page. I thought that the first, like, hour, Mm -hmm. I probably thought. But then some of the things that he wrote reminded me of my grandfather so much to where now when I hear it, I hear my grandpa talking Mm -hmm. because he was – he was gritty, you know, mm-hmm. Korean War gritty mm-hmm. and depression gritty. So, like, I'm hearing him tell it how it is. And, you know, and even, like, the terminology, like, he was a good man, mm-hmm. that was classic, you know, that was classic Papa right there. He's like, he, you know, he was a good man or, you know, that, that, that man's a, co- a coward or, you know, he was like, there was a clear line. You're above it or below it. That was it. Yeah. Yeah, Hackworth Hackworth def, definitely does that. Uh, Hackworth said this guy, the guys are either studs or duds. No <laughs> offense. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> totally true. <laughs> uh, we got Echelon Front Leadership Consultancy. We solve problems through leadership. You go to echelonfront.com for details there. We have EF Online, which is which is online training for leadership. We have musters where we get together and we get granular on leadership. We're executing these this year. The only reason we didn't, we were going to execute one last year, the last one of the year, and then I got Miss Rona. So we had to freaking cancel that thing. Um, But we're doing Orlando May 25th and 26th, Phoenix August 17th and 18th, Las Vegas October 28th and 29th. Go to extremeownership.com. We've sold out every event that we've ever done. So, and these events are, we have less seats because of social distancing and whatnot. So there's less seats. So if you want to come get there ASAP, we have EF Battlefield where we go out onto actual battlefields. The next one's coming up or in, we're doing the Battle of Gettysburg. We sold out the first one. We opened up a second one. Register ASAP if you want to come to that. And if you want to help service members active and retired, you wanna help their families, you wanna help Gold Star families, you can check out Mark Lee's mom. Mark Lee's mom has her own charity organization and if you wanna donate or you wanna get involved, go to americasmightywarriors.org and if you want more of my sustained sagas or you want more of Echo's mysterious meanderings, you can find us on the interwebs, on Twitter, Instagram, and on Facebook, Echo's at Echo Charles, I am at Jocko Willing. Dudley, so Dudley can be found at knockonarchery.com, and then on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, it's at knockontv. Yep. What else? Sounds YouTube, good. YouTube, knockonarchery. Yep. Yeah, just Insta's knockontv. Oh, okay, check. Yep. Wait. Wait. Twitter might be too. Twitter is too. I yeah. checked them this morning, and, and Facebook looks like that too. Echo, you got anything else? Uh, yeah, if like I have kids that I want them to get in art into archery, obviously you have you know direction for that scenario. Oh yeah, yep, no, same exact thing. Doesn't matter the age group. You know, look for a good shop, see if they have a good youth program. If not, then dive down the 
down the YouTube rat hole or, you know, follow on social media, try to give some type of free education, you know, if not every day, every other day. I mean, a lot of what I do is just trying to help the archery lifestyle in some for, form or fashion. Is there, so I got my son, he's four, a bow from Amazon. He, it's And it's like perfect where he puts a lot of effort and then he can pull it back. So yep. I, I remember pulling oh, back. Oh, is it like a compound like, bow? No, it's, it's like four? A, Amazon, yeah. Dang. It's the kind it. where I pulled it back. I was like, oh, he might not be able to do this. And then, but when he does it, he can do it. Mm-hmm. But like what's it shooting? Is it shooting suction in. cups or what's it shooting? Like no. nerf things? Or what's it shooting? I would say. Or you got broad and I don't, yeah, I don't know about all the arrow tips, heads, like whatever. Like what is it? What is the end it, of it made it of? It looks, it reminds me of, looks like, you know, the old school, like, you know, if you have archery class at school, you know, the thing like it, it's it's oh, not like, sharp, yeah, but it's yeah, made yeah, to I stick mean. into something. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah. A blunt point. Yeah. Like a blunt yeah. point. No. But it has a little tip to it. Kind of nice. kind of a thing. But you couldn't like but cut yourself just by scrap, scratching no, yourself with that. Negative. Point. I remember no. those. I remember those when I was But the, qu- the question is like, if I just buy a random bow like that, is that like a note? Like, should I not do that? Or is Honestly, it just with like, kids that are that young, just let them freaking watch arrows fly and have fun <laughs> okay that yeah. was my mindset pull back and let it rip keep them close so you know i tell people you know kids like playing games that they always win at so you know if you try to make your kid shoot at a target at your distance it's going to be problematic you know <laughs> keep it keep a target big keep them close if they see themselves hitting in the middle they don't really make the correlation of well that target's bigger than dads or this one's closer there you know if you're just like all right you know you shoot for the gold i'm gonna shoot for the gold let's you know and if they're like i beat you again i beat you again that's perfect scenario yeah echo charles we started talking about making a warrior kid bow what do you think i think that that's a great idea yeah what age dud can a kid get like a bow that's freaking like pretty legit i i think probably by seven or eight they can be going down the right path Mm -hmm. where you can teach some solid fundamentals and get something set up for them yep that's the warrior kid age too coincidentally Mm. we might have to keep going down that path awesome dudley anything else i'm good right oh man (laughs) awesome well like i said earlier man thanks for thanks for everything you've done for the archery community thanks for what you're doing for all the vets all over the place and and really you know thanks for what you've done for me i know that you like i said silver platter man it's been freaking awesome i appreciate it um and all you got back from me was a freaking broke neck (laughs) (laughs) and a freaking brown paper sack for instructions yesterday and you nearly drowned (laughs) i broke your neck and almost drowned you i'm I'm the best man I'm just a savage. He calls his friend Josh over to like give me a board. So I'm like, oh man, this is freaking awesome. Like he didn't even like deliver the cherry. He like had someone else make the cherry and then freaking just threw me into the freaking sea soup. <laughs> freaking watch me drown in seaweed and freaking get that 40 foot leash that was on my, my board wrapped around my neck 15 times. Yeah, uh, uh, look, I'm not the best guy in the world. I'm sorry, <laughs> but I appreciate your efforts back at me. Uh, thanks for telling us everything you learned today. Like I said, it's not just about archery. It's about life. It's about business. It's about moving forward. And thanks to your dad and his service, and and thanks to all the vets out there, and thanks to the th- current service members out there around the world protecting our freedom. And when you get done with that mission, you're going to need a new mission. Check out some archery, man. It's good for you. And to the people out there in service here at home, to police, law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, dispatchers, correctional officers, border patrol, secret service, and all the other first responders, thanks for protecting us in our times of need. And to everyone else out there, just remember that bow hunting is like life. The winds don't come easy and you don't always win. You don't always win, but you still have to prepare. You still have to get the reps. You still have to go through the process, and you have to keep going, keep trying to improve so that you can get what you are after. And until next time, this is John Dudley and Echo and Jocko out.